Hello everybody and welcome to Spindle TV. My name is Lanny Shaughnessy. I'm going to be your host this evening, just like every Tuesday evening. <laughs> and uh, hope you all had a very relaxing, safe, and uh, good 4th of July uh, for those of you that are in the States that celebrated that. And uh, uh, just hope you had a good weekend all together for you know everybody. Um, tonight we are going to do a live Q&A. We, we, over the last couple of weeks, we've been uh, talking about a lot of different projects, a lot of different things. And uh, so tonight, uh, I figured we'd kind of uh, have enough weeks past. Uh, I try to do a Q&A every once in a while so we can uh, have you guys and girls ask some questions and me go through and uh, do my best to answer those questions for you. There's already been some questions posted uh, in the group. Roger Brown, I'm going to be answering your question first. Uh, but if you do have questions, uh, go ahead and uh, put them in the chat area and I will go through and answer them. While I go through and answer them, I'm going to be talking to you about a design for uh, you know a project. Um, pretty fun project. Uh, kind of wall hanging type project that might be fun for a, a kids room, game room, uh, man cave, uh, she shed, whatever the case may be. Uh, and, uh, you know, be fun for, you know, friends, family, or what have you. And so I'm going to be talking to you about that and going over some uh, little uh, things with the design and kind of uh, finishing it up. Got a majority of it started just to kind of uh, keep the time down uh, but uh, we're going to go over and uh, cover everything uh, for sure. So with that being said, let's go ahead and jump over to uh, camera two. Right, camera two. And let's get me down in the bottom corner. Down here, cool. And um, tonight's uh, project that I'm going to be working on is a wall hanging Scrabble board. Uh, now this board is about uh, right now it's set at 36 inches in length by 24 inches tall. Um, the squares, uh, you know, in the game tiles are going to be about one and a half inches by one and a half inch square. Uh, you know, so not, not very big. But this could, of course, uh, you know, I, I got this uh, from, I saw this from um, a website, uh, um, Funhouse, I believe it is. Uh, I'll have to look up and see where it was. But uh, they had made a very big wall hanging board uh, out of, a, you know, a sheet of plywood, uh, you know, scrabble board and with, with uh, three and a half inch by three and a half inch tiles and everything and uh, which is great but I wanted to kind of size this down to fit relatively on most uh, CNC machines uh, but of course um, you know we could look at ways of breaking it down into sections to build it as we go but before we get into the design and everything I wanted to answer Roger's question uh, he fired away um, with uh, you know in selecting a VBIT how do you know which one to use uh, and Roger, that really depends on the design and uh, what you plan on doing with it. Uh, an example being, uh, let's say that uh, I was carving these letters here, and uh, these letters are relatively small. The space between the lines is small. Now, depending on the angle of my V bit, whether it's a you know 22 degree, 30 degree, 60, 90, you know 120 degrees, uh, and anything in between. My cut is going to be the same, but my cut depth will vary based on the space of the, between those lines. So if I have a wide space, it's gonna be a deeper cut. If I have a smaller space, it's gonna be a shallower cut. And that is based on the width or the space between the lines and the angle of the V-bit. A uh, 22 degree V-bit is gonna give me much more of a depth of cut because the software looks at the, the two lines and it calculates automatically how deep it needs to cut for those two lines to meet at a V in the middle of the cut. So if I'm using a 22 degree V bit, then my cut's gonna be a little deeper. If I'm using a 30, a little shallower, 60, 90, 120, right? So it's not gonna take much uh, depth of cut for those lines to meet at a V uh, the wider that angle goes. So depending on your design, like in this one, uh, for these letters and all, I'll most likely use a 60 degree V bit 
but I'll also look at the depth of the cut and determine if that's going to be too much or too little. Uh, when it comes to my one and a half inch by one and a half inch tiles, I'm going to use a 22 degree V bit so I can get a little bit of depth or definition out of that cut. If I were carving, uh, you know, the space uh, between these lines of this rectangle here, this rectangle here, uh, and I was V carving that, then, you know, I have a choice setting a flat depth to limit my cut or using a wider angle V bit that may uh, provide me with that nice V cut without having to do a flat depth, without, without having to do a limit. Uh, it might provide me that nice V cut, but not cut through my material uh, or what have you. Um, a, you know, an example, let's take, uh, for instance, let's take a rectangle here and I'm going to draw a narrow rectangle here and a little bit wider rectangle here and let's say that I was V carving these two cuts. Um, if I were to V carve them with uh, no start depth, no flat depth and a 60 degree, uh, let's see what, yeah, 60 degree V bit. When I go to calculate that tool path and I go to preview that visible cut, let's zoom into that here. Um, my narrower cut is cutting about 1.221 inches deep. My wider cut is cutting about 2.2923 inches deep. And I can see that by the numbers at the bottom of the screen. Uh, down here, I can uh, see that uh, by moving my mouse over the cut. Now, if I took those same two cuts and I change that 60 degree V bit to let's say a 22 degree V bit and I calculate that cut, I'm gonna cut through my material. My material is only a half inch thick, but it's gonna require 0.9 inches to cut. So I'm gonna go ahead and, and, and still do that anyway so we can uh, see that cut. And you can see that black here where it cut all the way through. Now I only cut about 0.33 inches deep here, a little under 3 eighths of an inch deep with that 22 degree V bit, but I cut all the way through here, so I don't want that. And I definitely don't want to set a flat depth, right? So now I choose a wider V bit. And we know the 60 is not gonna cut through, but let's go ahead and change that to a 120 degree V bit, just as an example, and uh, recalculate that tool path. When we preview it again, now my wide cut here, I'm only cutting about 0.09 inches deep, and my uh, narrower cut, I'm only cutting about 30 thousandths inch deep, about a 32nd inch deep. So based on the design and what it calls for or what depth you desire, your V-bit, the angle of that V-bit is going to change that depth. The narrower the angle, the deeper the cut, the wider the angle, the shallower the cut, and it's also going to be based on your design, uh, you know, what size your letters are or your design and, uh, you know, the spacing between them, how deep it's going to cut and stuff. So that's about the best answer I can give you on that. And hopefully that kind of somewhat explains it for you. But uh, a V-carve is going to be based on the space between your lines and your angle of your V-bit. Uh, and it's going to automatically calculate a depth of cut. You can limit that cut. It's called a flat depth. You can limit it. But if you didn't want to limit, you wanted a nice V cut, then you may change the angle of your bit to be a wider angle to get a nice V cut, but a shallower cut if that's what you desire. If you need more depth and definition because it's not going to cut deep enough, then you're going to use a narrower angle V bit. Uh, and uh, most commonly, what I always say is, you know, someone in their arsenal of tools, they should have at least a 22 degree V bit, uh, 60, 90, and 120 degree V bit. Uh, those four bits are a pretty good uh, uh, selection of bits to have in your arsenal of tools and, um, and stuff uh, depending on your design. Like with my design, let me delete uh, this tool path and these two vectors, but my design here is going to, um, you know, uh, there's going to be different depths of cut my small tiles down here, the letter tiles and everything, I'm gonna most likely use a 22 degree V bit. I may use a 60 still, I'll look and see what the depth of cut is. 
but on my uh, bigger you know, part of the sign with lines are, I'll probably use a 60 because I don't want it too deep of a cut kind of thing. So it would just vary depending on, on those circumstances. So hopefully that clarifies a little bit and helps you to you know to understand why you why you would choose one bit versus the other and uh, kind of uh, give you an idea of, of of you know what to do when you you know you want more depth narrower angle when you want less depth wider angle things like that hopefully that answers your question um, and uh, the um, uh, the design really and you know the design is really going to kind of dictate what the cuts going to be depending on what you want uh, and um, uh, you know you you might not want a V cut you might want a flat depth right and you want to flatten out your letters but you want your wall angles to be a certain angle and then your flat depth so you might want them to be 22 60 90 you know 120 and then go into the flat depth right um, but uh, that's just again it's going to call for what the design calls for if i was doing a chamfer around the edge of the board i'd most likely use a 90 degree v bit a nice 45 degree chamfer around the edge of my board kind of thing so those types of things are going to be what uh you know kind of dictate what bit to choose and so hopefully that uh that that explains it um let's see here uh good question by the way uh i appreciate that uh Roger, let's see here. Hey, Stephen Main, all the way from Australia. How you doing, bud? Thanks for joining me. Um, let's see here. So Harvey uh, asks Harvey. Um, uh, Harvey I always gets your last name wrong. Uh, Matches. Uh, he um, he asks. You know, I had a Papa Bear project for Father's Day. Uh, it was a 3D model, and he said, uh, you know, what ball nose bit, what tapered ball nose bit would you use? Um, and uh, I would, depending on the detail and stuff, I'd probably, an eighth of an inch would be the biggest, of course, uh, but, um, you know, if I can get the detail out of the cut that I want in my preview, it'll, it'll show me. If I can get the detail with an eighth inch tapered ball nose, then that's what I'm gonna go with. That's my go-to bit. Uh, if I want a little bit more detail in the bear and everything, then I'm going to uh, want to use a 16th inch. Uh, let's see if we can open up that design. Let's see if we can, uh, I'll import the model into this. Let me um, come in here and uh, turn off all these other layers for a minute. And let's go into layer one. And let's just go into the modeling tools and I'll import that model. Uh, that model uh, was in the Father's Day projects and World's Greatest Papa Bear. And that project um, was about 15 by 11. Let's click uh, OK there. Let that uh, bring it in. Do, do, do. Come on, V car, bro. We're all waiting on you. All right, let's uh, close this so we can see the model. So, in uh, you know uh, the model here, um, the de there, there's a few you know fur details and stuff in here but for the most part it's a pretty large design i would uh, most likely go with an eighth inch uh, tapered ball nose and um you know when uh completing that cut um let me bring it uh let me bring my board size up to a three quarter inch board And let me make sure my model's at the top there. If I were doing a finish cut with this, let's go ahead and grab my eighth inch tapered ball nose. Do -do 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 and uh, no boundary offset for this. Um, I'm gonna use the model as the boundary just as a uh, 
so it just calculates in that area so it'll be a little bit quick calculation and when I preview it the preview as long as I have my preview visibility turned up I'll show you how to turn that up uh, once it calculates and everything uh, as long as I have it turned up to like an extremely high I'm gonna get a really good representation of what my projects gonna look like so let me go into my preview simulation quality and turn that up to extremely high and uh, let's preview this cut here okay now right away as I come in and zoom in here I can see uh, the tool marks uh, between the letters kind of around the letters is where I'm mostly gonna see it like in the A uh, and everything here uh, for the simple fact of you know the eighth inch tape ball nose can't get down into those areas so that's the tip of the bit that's leaving those tool marks and stuff in there uh, and everything and so uh, with that you know looking at that I may decide you know what um, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, do it with a sixteenth of an inch end mill now if you have Vetric Aspire um, people with Vetric Aspire they have the ability of call, doing what's called rest machining meaning they can carve their design with a larger ball nose bit and then they can actually uh, create a uh, tool path to do the rest of the design basically everywhere that that bit couldn't fit uh, do the rest of the design with a smaller bit uh, in Vetric VCarve Desktop and Pro we don't have that option or that, that capability so we have to use one bit or the other right so if I came back and uh, change this to my sixteenth of an inch tapered ball nose and I want to zoom in uh, kind of uh, let's calculate that toolpath it's going to take just a little bit longer to calculate uh, with the sixteenth of an inch tapered ball nose but I'm not going to reset the preview I'm just going to preview the cut over it so you can see where it goes back and cleans up um, for me I don't mind a longer runtime for the quality. Uh, you know, uh, I want you know a good quality, so I'll most likely use a sixteenth of an inch tapered ball nose. But if it's good enough, right? If it's if it's hey, you know, you can't even hardly see those tool marks or anything. Uh, you know, they're very uh, you know barely visible and stuff. Then I'm gonna go with the uh, the larger bit that's gonna give me a little bit shorter runtime. Um, it kind of depends on the situation the circumstance you know um, but for this size design and all I'd probably use the 16th it's gonna be a much longer runtime for me but the quality is gonna be you know great and this is a gift that I'm gonna give someone right or it could be something I'm selling or what have you so if we I'm gonna kind of zoom in on the a area here I'm just gonna preview this cut and uh, hopefully as it goes through you can see it start to clean up around the letters right especially around that PNA as it goes as it went through uh, so now you know I don't have those tool marks and everything in those letters and stuff right so uh, that's the you know and I'm gonna get a much more uh, better quality in the fur uh, kind of you know design of the bear and uh, and everything and so I'm gonna get a much cleaner cut uh, with that sixteenth of an inch tapered ball nose so that's gonna be kind of the way I go right so hopefully uh, Harvey that answered your question alright let's go ahead and uh, get this model out of the design here and let me see what else you guys uh, throwing at me here Okay, so Brooks Martin asks a question. Uh, he says, hey, Laney, when merging components, like two models, when you're merging two models together, um, can Aspire create fillets between the components? And um, the uh, fillets are basically, uh, when you're talking 2.5D designs, uh, let's say we have a rectangle with four sharp corners, but I wanted to radius those uh, external corners and things. Uh, that's a fillet. Uh, there are different fillets within the software. 
uh, in the fillet tool and everything, we have what's called normal fillets. We have dog bone fillets, T-bone fillets, and then we have um, our plasma and, and uh, drag knife type fillets and everything. Now, the when it comes to components, um, Brooks, uh, those models and everything, uh, you really... Well, wouldn't have the fillets, you know, those roundovers and all, in unless you, you know, add some smoothing to the design. When you smooth the design, it rounds over those edges, uh, creating kind of those fillets and stuff. Unless you're calling a fillet a different, you know, something that it's not, uh, or, or unless you're calling a fillet something different. Um, fillet kind of normally refers to 2D designs, you know, creating radiuses and stuff, but in 3D models, when you're merging 3D models, when you do a smoothing, it creates those rounded edges. It kind of, um, let's see if I can uh, come in and let's open up an Aspire program here for a quick second. And I'm just gonna create a blank new file and uh, bah, 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 bah. let's go ahead and just throw a star in here just for you know uh, sake purposes uh, we'll uh, kind of for two stars like that now in this one shape here let's split our view for a minute and uh, on this one shape I'm gonna go into the modeling tools and uh, I'm gonna create a uh, kind of a rounded profile I'm gonna go 90 degrees 90 degrees, um, 90, there we go. Uh, and I'll give it a base height of about a quarter of an inch. And I'm gonna limit that height uh, to about a 16th of an inch. Now, when I create this component and everything, if we zoom in, okay, Let's take the uh, let's take this other star and create just a flat a flat. Let's go with a flat one, and I'm going to go 0.375, and uh, we'll merge that one in and click apply. Okay, so with the flat edge and everything. Um, you know, there's some pixelation. I don't have a, the resolution turned up very high on this, but uh, you know, to create that fillet, um, that rounded edge that we have on this other star. Let me see if I can find a good view of it. Uh, basically, we created a rounded profile, but we limited that the height of that profile so it flattened off at the top. And so as it started to round over, it then flattened off and it created those filleted edges, those round over edges. With the flat part, you can see we didn't have that. But now, if I had those uh, two models uh, and I, you know, and I added some smoothing to them, uh, to the components, as I smooth that, you can see that it starts to round over that edge kind of somewhat creating a fillet but not really um, but the smoothing uh, you know uh, kind of creates that you know between that merged component it kind of smooths it out uh, and everything kind of rounds over those edges so now you can see the edges of the top model which was flat and now has that rounded over edge right uh, so um, if that's what you're referring to as fillets, if you have two models merged together, you can smooth them out to create that rounding. Or if you're creating the components uh, from scratch, then you may use the curved profile with a limit. Uh, and that limit uh, to height uh, will flatten off as it gets to that height, it flattens off, creating that rounded over fillet. So let me, um, let me know if that answers your question at all. Okay, cool. All right, and um, and yeah, it's it's yeah, there it, it's a lot of terms, right? In the design world, uh, you know, the fillets are those rounded over edges, and welding it probably means something completely different. You know, the probably those nice welds, those those uh, fillets. But let me know if that little demonstration there answered your question uh, and everything. 
and all. Uh, very good question. Let's see here. Uh, Stephen Main, um, can you explain the boundary offset in the modeling toolpath, please? Uh, help file doesn't give details. All right, so the boundary offset. When we are carving a model, let's, uh, I'm just going to stick in uh, VCAR Pro for right now. I get it now. Alexa, stop. <laughs> um, let's see here. We'll just grab this horse right here. This prancing Arabian, cantering Arabian. When I am uh, creating a tool path, whether it be the rough cut or the finish cut, um, let me get my model height to an appropriate uh, size here, 0.74. Got to scale it down to kind of meet my material there. Um, when I am creating the toolpath, whether it be the 3D rough cut or the 3D finish, the boundary offset uh, is basically how far I want to either let my bit go past the boundary of the model. In this case, it'd be the horse would be the boundary, or if I had a vector, that would be the boundary if I had a selected vector. Uh, I can either let the, um, the bit go over that boundary, or I can have it stay away from that boundary, or if I have no boundary offset, it goes right up to the edge of the model. So if I um, you know, were to create, let's say a roughing toolpath on the model here, the model boundary, and I let the bit um, go past the boundary, and let's go past the boundary by a quarter of an inch so we can really see it, and I calculate that toolpath, what that's permitting is I've said, okay, I wanna use the model as the boundary, but the bit is allowed to go past that boundary, that boundary offset is allowed to go past that boundary by my quarter of an inch. So when we uh, preview, and first of all, let me stop that, I hit the wrong button. Let's reset that and preview the selected toolpath. When it goes uh, around the model here, and all, that boundary offset, my bit was allowed, it was permitted to go past the model by that quarter of an inch. So the, you know it came out here and cut instead of staying on the model. Now, if I had no boundary offset, and I preview uh, you know that toolpath, then it's limited to the model as the boundary. Okay, so it's uh, going right up uh, to the edge of the model and the mains out here and everything. So it's you know going right up to the edge of that model. Um, if I I don't believe in the three D modeling, I don't I don't believe a negative uh, boundary offset uh, is permitted. But let's find out. I think so. It might be. Um, yeah. So I can go less than the boundary by doing a negative number. Now that's different. So you guys and girls that are watching aren't confused. When we're doing boundary offsets on 2D vectors like pocket cuts, profile cuts and all that, the negative number allows the bit to go beyond the line. The positive number keeps the bit away from the line. In this case with 3D modeling, the negative number keeps the, uh, the cut away from the edge of my model the positive boundary offset lets it go past or beyond the model. And um, uh, some people will create a boundary offset, uh, especially for the rough cut, to kind of clear out around the model a little bit more so that their tapered ball nose bit, which tapers down to an angle, so if it's a deep cut and all, the shank doesn't collide with the walls, right? So that would be kind of the, the, the main reason. So um, Stephen Main, let me know if that answers your question. And uh, let me uh, remove these tool paths and this model. All right, cool. Good questions so far, guys. This is awesome. Hopefully that's, uh, that was useful to you. Uh, let's see here. Who was after Steven? We had... Um... Kool-Aid. 
Speaking of V bits, two flute or floor flute, two flute or four flute. Um, well, that really depends. Uh, when it comes to uh, metal machining and things like that, you know, uh, typically when we get into non-ferrous metals and all, you know, we're using more flutes, like a four flute or five flute bit. Uh, your upcut spiral bits, downcut spiral bits, V bits, and all. Uh, they're typically going to be either a three flute, like the white side 1541 60 degree V bit is a three flute bit, um, or they could be a two flute bit, uh, such as the white side 1550, um, uh, you know, which is just, you know, you know a two flute bit. Um, really, I'm, I'm going to say no more than three flutes, right? So two flute bit is going to be preferred in that. And when you're doing most metals and things like that uh, in, in plastics and all your O flute bits uh, and um, your uh, woods and all, you know, like your upcut spiral and downcut spiral, two flute bits are going to be better. Uh, the more flutes you get into, the more likely, you know, you're, you're getting into uh, a bit that you, you got to, you know, spin slower so that um, you don't burn up that bit because the gullets in the, uh, uh, between those flutes are much smaller. Uh, and everything and um, uh, you know we can't you know a two flute bit I would you know say spin at you know 22,500 rpms on a quarter inch end mill two flute bit right if I was using a quarter inch four flute bit I'd be spinning that around 12,000 rpms uh, because the gullets are much smaller and everything uh, I'm gonna recommend if you're if it's mostly like woods and plastics and things like that that you're gonna be uh, three flutes or less if you're in your non ferrous metals and all uh, you can go up into your four flute and five flute bits. So hopefully Kool-Aid that helped you out a little bit. Um, let's see here. T button. Does the order of components listed in the level tree matter when regards to stacking the components in the correct order of the design? Or is the height of each adjustment based on that shape height? The order that the levels are, uh, or that the components are in your uh, component tree in the modeling tab is absolutely important. Uh, just like building a house, we always start with the foundation and build up. We want to build our models from the foundation up. Uh, it does play a major role, especially the way the models combine with one another uh, and everything. Um, uh, we want uh, to build from the ground up. So if I and I got to go over to Aspire for this one. Uh, in um, let's get rid of this model for a minute. Delete that star. And uh, let's see here. Let's draw a rectangle here. Let's take this uh, star here and uh, make it a little smaller and I'll kind of throw it we'll throw it here in the middle um, let's say the the rectangle was my base right on my base I'm going to want uh, you know that to build that first and then I want to stack on top of it uh, so when I'm creating that model and everything uh, let's say that that's a flat profile. Uh, let's go three eighths of an inch tall, and uh, it'll be an add mode because uh, we're going to be building on top of that. Um, I want you know that model to be uh, first in my list. Now, right now it's above the star, but you can see the star is sitting on top of it and everything. But notice when I move that that uh, component below that. Um, uh, that star turned green and it has to do with the way I you know uh, combine something so you know if I were uh, subtracting this model uh, from that shape or if I was uh, merging the model with the shape and everything I want uh, to make sure that I am uh, you know building from that foundation up because if I'm not, if, if I have a component that should be lower in the list, uh, you know, above another one, and I have a certain com way it combines, I could be screwing up how, how it's uh, combining uh, with it because it's saying, okay, uh, it's on top of here, so it's gonna, you know, 
subtract you know from that star or when the, when the star should be subtracting from it and, and things like that so if I had let's take my star and uh, we'll make it an add so it's sitting on top uh, let's move my other component back on on top of it here and change the combine mode uh, and everything well now that I've subtracted this um, rather than subtracting it you know from the star I've actually pushed the whole thing down into my material when I wanted to you know possibly you know subtract from that star the whole thing is, is pushed uh, down below uh, if I were to you know uh, change that uh, component um, then the uh, the way they merge together let's make this one a merge which one is that one okay and you can see that I've subtracted the rectangle but I've merged the star which means the rectangle is kind of recessed in my material uh, down below and my star being merged with it is kind of been built up and uh, it's kind of almost twice its thickness now uh, and everything um, we want uh, to make sure that our foundation whatever it may be is solid and then whatever component uh, is going to be on top of that and we're stacking and stacking when I take uh, this little guy here and I create that shape um, let's say I create this as a prism uh, and let's go 45 degrees uh, and a base height I'm gonna do it as an add first right uh, so it should be sitting on top of that star there uh, and I've got the height limited let's turn the limit off I want a kind of full prism cut there we go that's a funky looking prism but you get the idea now if I were to merge that in you know it's kind of sunk down now I can give it base height and stuff and kind of build it if it's supposed to be merged you know I don't want it taking on the shape of whatever's underneath it I want it to be solid and then I want to build the height up from there uh, if I build that height up let's say 0.5 inches and click apply okay if I close this if I were to, uh, especially, I'm only on one level right now, so when it comes to multiple levels, that really makes a difference. Um, but if I were to uh, move this down, then you can see now that because it's at the bottom, it's not merging uh, like it's supposed to. Um, it's supposed to be merged into the model, and then my base height is going to determine how much it's sitting up from that you know that foundation that base height that I'm building underneath it and stuff so yes it does absolutely matter think of a house building from the foundation up always start with your base components and build up from there I don't know if that was a good explanation or not but hopefully it was and um, uh, and you get it but yes it, it's, it's absolutely plays a role um, especially when you get into multiple levels how those what what order those levels are in and what order the models are in within those levels is plays a really big role so if you build from the foundation up you're going to be much better off it's going to be much uh you know much more understandable to get what you want when things aren't going quite right it's like whoa what's going on with that and all of a sudden you start organizing those models in the appropriate level and then things start looking the way they're supposed to look then it's like oh I just had them organized wrong so uh, all that good stuff so hopefully that answers that question all right let's um, uh, we're gonna take a break from questions for one second we're gonna talk about this design so basically uh, I've got a design here for a wall hanging Scrabble board now um, on this uh, design here I've kind of already started laying out the board but I want to change the layout actually I, I, I laid it out with a spacing of uh, an eighth of an inch in between thinking I was gonna take my V bit and kind of uh, cut some lines and stuff and I don't want that so I need to create a new array 
a new array uh, for my uh, squares and everything. And so the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna delete all of these except for this guy here. And I'm gonna use my array tool. Uh, so I've got a 36 inch wide by 24 inch uh, tall board here. Uh, my rectangles currently are about one and three eighths by one and three eighths, but I wanna change their size. Uh, I wanna change their size to one and a half inches. Okay. And uh, I wanna create an array. Now this array is going to have uh, 15 rows and 15 columns for a Scrabble board. Uh, and um, I want a gap of zero on the X and Y. I want edge to edge. I want all the edges touching here, okay? Now, by doing that, I've kind of changed my design here because all of my little tiles here are uh, one and three eighths by one and three eighths. And I've got a whole bunch of them that uh, you know I need to bring up to an inch and a half. Well, rather than uh, doing one by one by one, you know, change that to an inch and a half, that to an inch and a half, that to an inch and a half, I wanna change them all at one time. And I'm gonna use the box method. If you guys have ever followed me uh, in past classes and stuff, some of you may be new and all, but the box method of resizing multiple items at one time is great. Uh, it's very simple. It's hard to kind of uh, grasp what, what are we doing here, but um, what it is is we're gonna take a rectangle and we're gonna draw a box around our uh, full design or our, our objects that we want to resize. Now, it's crucial that my box, either my width of my box or the height of my box, is relative to the size of my tiles to kind of keep the aspect ratio the same. What I mean by that is my tiles are 1.375 by 1.375. Well my width here needs to, if I take that 1.375 and I roll that decimal over one time to the right, that is 13.75, right? And so my box width needs to, or height, whichever one is more appropriate, needs to be 13.75 or roll that decimal over again, 137.5. If I keep rolling that decimal point over to the right, as long as my one side of my box or the other is relative to my object sizes, then uh, I can scale them appropriately. So if I look at my box size right now, it is 12 and three quarters wide by 39 inches tall. Well, 39, I'm not gonna go with that. I'm just gonna, since I'm under 13.75, then uh, I'm gonna go ahead and change this to 13.75. And again, remember if I if I was at 1.375, all I'm doing is I'm rolling that decimal over one time, right? So 13.75, let's uh, put that there. And I don't care what the height is. Uh, all I care about is one side of my box is relative to my, my, my objects. Now, the cool thing about this is, is if I select my objects, except for these two boxes right here, let's get them out of there. If I select my objects and everything and I resize my box up to 15, right, 15, it's gonna resize everything inside of it up to it as well. Now that 15, if I roll my decimal point back over to the left, that's 1.5, right? So if I click apply on this 15, and I come in here and I look at my box sizes now, they're 1.5 inches, right? So let's undo that. Uh, that boxes were 1.375 to begin with. And I drew a box around it, made my box 13.75 inches wide, which is relative. Uh, and then the height just surrounding my boxes didn't matter. And when I select all of my objects, including my large box, um, I'm gonna size my box up to 15 because that number is relative of 1.5. 1.5 decimal rolled over is 15. Roll the decimal over again, 150. Roll the decimal over again, 1500, that kind of thing. So uh, if I size it up to 15 inches, that sizes everything inside of it as well. And now all of my parts are 1.5 inches, right? Uh, by 1.5 inches. So it's a quick way to resize everything so I didn't have to do them all one by one. Give that a try sometime. 
Uh, and where that really comes in handy is, uh, let's say that um, I had parts, right? Let's say I had multiple pieces uh, and inside those pieces there were slots, uh, like mortises. Uh, and let's say those mortises were uh, one inch tall, that's fine. So let's go in here and uh, let's uh, hold down the control key and I'm gonna just throw a bunch of mortises in here, right? Uh, and all that wonderful stuff. And uh, if I select this box now, <clears throat> let's say I wanna make my one inch mortise, I wanna make it one and a quarter inches, right? So I'm, 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 I'm expanding the width right here, okay? So it's one inch, I wanna go one and a quarter, so it's that height there that's relative this height here that's relative. So if I'm at one inch tall, then I need to roll that decimal point over and on my height here needs to be relative to that, either 10 inches, 100 inches, 1,000 inches, that kind of thing. So let's look at my box size. Let's draw a box around both of these, first of all. Okay, and that box size is uh, 51 inches wide by 54 inches tall. Well, I'm gonna go uh, 51 inches wide is fine. I'm gonna go by 100 inches tall, okay? Uh, and uh, now I'm gonna take that whole thing and I'm gonna size it up to um, from 100 to 125 because I wanna go one and a quarter, right? 125 and uh, click apply. And when I do that now, my height on my parts is one and a quarter, right? On all my data, they're one and a quarter. Uh, so if I was doing a design from design and make, or not, uh, I'm sorry, make CNC, where it was like those 3D puzzles, and I open up the eighth inch scale uh, puzzle where all of my slots are eighth inch thick, well, I'm using plywood, and that's gonna be seven thirty seconds. Um, uh, no, quarter inch is seven thirty seconds. So let's say I'm working with a quarter inch scale, and my but my plywood is seven thirty seconds. I need to size my parts down to that seven thirty seconds because you know the, you know so they'll fit and all. Uh, this is a great way to select all those parts and scale them down all at once to get all my grooves and everything to the size they need to be. It's a wonderful method, uh, the box method, and. Um, I talk about it more and I can't remember what video it is, but in one of my videos I talk about it. Uh, uh, it's, it's a great method to use. I think it was another Q&A that we did. All right, so I've got all my tiles now sized up to inch and a half, uh, except for these two guys right here. They're still one and three eighths. So I'm just gonna manually size them up, right? So uh, there's only two of them there. I'm just gonna go 1.5. And this one as well. Oops, don't do that. 1.5. So we can manually do them as well too, but we could also do it as bulk. And I could have selected those in the big rectangle. I could have put those in the big rectangle and it would have sized them up also. Uh, but I wanted to keep them out so I could size them individually to show you that you know we can size one at a time or we could size them all at once, that kind of thing. All right. Um, so now I've got all my tiles and everything and I've got my board uh, squares laid out. Now I need to start laying out my little vectors for my uh, triple letter word, double letter word, triple, uh, uh, I'm sorry, triple letter score, double letter, double word, triple word uh, scores. I'm gonna lay those out uh, in my star and everything. Um, and uh, as we do that, let's go over and look at another question. Um, Let's see here. Michael uh, Meslick says, the offset question is about the molding toolpath. Molding toolpath. So uh, in the molding toolpath, um, the boundary offset that plays the same way, uh, Michael, the answer, the question that I answered, uh, uh, the way I answered it in the 3D modeling, it, it's the same way. 
the molding toolpath, uh, I'm either letting the bit go past the boundary of that molding profile, or I'm wanting it to stay away from the, 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 the boundary. So it's it, relatively the same thing. A molding toolpath is a 3D model, but it's a toolpath, it's not a 3D component, it's a toolpath of a 3D model. Uh, so the boundary offset works exactly the same way that I explained earlier. Um, so Stephen, uh, again, Stephen says that Michael said that it was about the molding toolpath, same way, okay? So if I were, uh, we'll go into this one more time. Let's go into clip art and make it easy on myself. Molding profiles, let's just grab a molding profile here. Bear with me, I gotta log in and grab this molding profile. Stand by. Okay, excellent. Let's uh, grab that again. Okay, so let's say, let's get, uh, I need a vector uh, for the um, molding profile. We'll just go here. And uh, on the molding profile, uh, I've got this and I'm selecting this and uh, everything on here the uh, depth exceeds my material thickness let me resize that real quick keep forgetting that I'm working with a certain size material let's go uh, half inch there we go all right one more time in that molding tool path I'm gonna select this select my molding profile it's gonna sweep that profile along this way uh, down the length of this and uh, I'm going to be using a uh, 3.6 degree uh, eighth inch tapered ball nose um, I won't use a large area clearance tool I uh, don't necessarily need to create sharp corners because it's a straight line and I want a boundary offset of an eighth of an inch um, when I calculate this and everything Let's zoom into that. Reset that preview and preview that toolpath. Okay, come over here. That eighth of an inch, it allowed me to go past that molding profile by that eighth of an inch. If I came in here and said no boundary offset, uh, my bit's too big. Let me change bits. I'm gonna make my profile a little bit bigger because my bit's too big. Uh, in this case, it would require me to have a boundary offset because my bit's too big to fit on that small profile. Let's resize this up, scale it up. Size tool, let's go three quarters of an inch. All right, let's do that one more time so we can move on. Okay, so with um, no boundary offset, okay. It goes right to the end of my profile. My profile, if I tilt, let me see if I can tilt this a little bit. My profile comes down here. If I add a boundary offset, let's go an eighth of an inch boundary offset. Uh, I'll leave this here. You can see that it's allowed to go past that boundary. Let's preview it. So I actually cut through the material when I went past the boundary uh, here but it allowed me to go past that model boundary by an eighth of an inch. Same thing as with the model, just like I showed you a moment ago. Okay, all right, cool. So uh, it is the same thing. All right, let's delete this stuff. And 
let's get rid of this. I use vectors. Cool beans. All right. Um, so moving on past that, hopefully you guys get it now um, and everything. Uh, let's see here. Yes, good answer. I'll quit moving around them. Let's see here. <laughs> Mathematics. Um, nice technique. Uh, why don't they say the true size of lumber, like three quarter is not three quarter? Now, Blue Knight, uh, I, I, Blue Knight, I think you don't live in the United States. Um, you know, and uh, I think you guys have the metric system, and I believe where you are, you have the metric system. And your metric plywood, if it's 10 millimeter plywood, it's 10 millimeter plywood. Um, in uh, the US, we have our nominal measurements and our actual measurements. Uh, the history of how that developed, I, I'm, I can't go into the history of it all, but uh, you know, uh, back in the day, a two by four was a two by four. Um, and uh, over the years, um, when they started, uh, you know, uh, really producing lumber and everything, uh, they came up with this nominal uh, actual measurement. Um, so when you go into the store and you buy a one by eight, you are actually buying a three quarter inch thick board that is seven and a quarter inches in thickness. When it comes to plywood, um, when you buy a three quarter inch sheet of plywood, you're buying a 23 30 second inch sheet of plywood. Um, why? I don't know. Uh, you will have to ask the lumber industry that one. That's that's not my forte, but uh, uh, I believe it is different overseas. Uh, I think when you guys and girls, I think you're, uh, when you buy a 10 millimeter sheet of plywood, it's 10 millimeters, I think. Correct me if I'm wrong for anyone that's overseas that work with the metric system. And Brooks Martin says money. <laughs> True, but there's actually a, a fun, there, there's a history of that. Um, uh, you could Google it, uh, and then I think in Wikipedia and all, there's an answer to it, but you can Google uh, why a 2x4 is not 2x4, right? Something like that, and uh, it'll give you kind of the breakdown of how that all occurred over the years. It's pretty interesting. Blue Knight, you're in Kentucky. Okay. Well, you're in the U.S., so you work in inches, so you're used to, uh, you know, our uh, imperial system uh, and everything, and uh, it uh, it is just what it is, man. Um uh, could could come down to money. I think it came down to money or whatever. But uh, uh, Wikipedia, uh, you know, search it, Google search it. You know, why is a two by four not two by four? And uh, and uh, there's a there's a nice. I, I don't know where the article is, but there's a good article that explains kind of the the history of the process and everything. It's fun. Okay, um, so. Let's, uh, while you guys are waiting for, while I'm waiting for some more questions, let's get our board laid out. So the first thing I wanna do is, of course, our star here uh, goes into the uh, center of our grid. Uh, and uh, then from there, we have, um, if I look, I gotta use my cheat sheet here. Uh, we start out in this bottom corner with a triple word score, then it's four double words, then triple letter, then double letter. So uh, let's go ahead and I'm, I've got my letters laid out here, but I'm gonna hold the control key down uh, and um, that's gonna allow me to uh, pull copies of this off and everything. And uh, so I've got my triple word score here and then there's four double words. So uh, one, two, three, four. Um, Right, one, two, three, four, and I then uh, triple word, one, two, three, four, then triple letter, double letter, uh, triple letter, hold down the control key, and I'm snapping, I got smart snapping turned on, so I'm automatically snapping right to uh, my um, design, and my star was off by one square, that goes, here um, and uh, so when I'm using these letters because I've got to lay out this entire board here uh, the control key allows me to make a copy so I'm dragging a copy but when I grab that copy in the middle I can snap it to the middle of the rectangle this grid here right each of these rectangles are individual so I can snap to the center of them 
Um, now coming up, uh, we're gonna skip two squares. It's gonna be a double letter. Uh, so grab the double letter, hold down that control key, skip two squares, double letter, skip three squares, and it's a triple word there. And wonderful thing, a one, two, three, triple word goes in line with the star. Uh, I'm gonna give you guys all these vectors when I get them laid out and everything for you. Uh, this board, um, once it gets laid out, let me turn on all the other vectors here and stuff. Um, it's uh, this area here, this rectangle here. Uh, we're gonna outline it, we're gonna carve an outline. We may do a shallow pocket, but we're gonna, we're gonna be painting that uh, with a few coats of chalkboard paint. We're gonna prime that area we're gonna paint it with a few coats of chalkboard paint so we can keep score with the chalkboard uh, and everything. Uh, we're gonna put in a little tray right here for our chalk uh, and stuff. These uh, letter tiles here, they're gonna be individual tiles that uh, they're all gonna connect. And these, this when this hangs up on the wall, these letters are gonna connect by magnets, right? So uh, when it comes to the uh, magnets, let me... Uh, Get back to uh, Amazon here. Let's see, is this my, that's my, uh, let's go Neodymium round. Neo. Bear with me. <laughs> um Bear with me, I, I had all these things open. Neo, Neo, I was spelling Neo wrong. Neo. Come on, Lenny, you can do it. Okay, let's see here. Copy that. I'm gonna go all. I'll pull it up here around. And magnets, there we go. All right, let me pull this over on the screen. Let me find them. It's gonna be the six millimeter by three millimeter. There we go. Pull this over here on the screen. All right, so this is gonna take uh, the magnets. We're gonna have uh, magnets come up on the, uh, you know, we're gonna be putting magnets in on the back of this board. Uh, and um, our tiles, our letter tiles, are gonna have magnets in them as well so they can stick on the board so they can hang on the wall. Now, there are uh, 225 squares, right? 15 by 15. Uh, and then there are a total of a hundred tiles. Uh, so about 350 magnets we're gonna need, right? So uh, these six millimeter by three millimeter uh, round uh, neodymium magnets here, 200 piece pack, uh, is uh, runs around uh, $12.99. So we're gonna need, let's say two packs of this, right? So it's gonna cost us about $24 in magnets uh, and everything. And uh, that six millimeter, that's great. It's going to give us, a, it's about 0.27 um, uh, inches in uh, diameter uh, by 0.11 uh, inches in diameter. That's six millimeter by three millimeter. And uh, we can use a quarter inch end mill and kind of a drilling tool path to drill the hole. That'll give us a little play to get our magnets down into our tiles and in the back of our board and stuff. So the back of this board is gonna be riddled with uh, magnet holes uh, and everything here in just a moment. Um, 
but uh, the uh, in Vetric launching an upgrade soon. Uh, yes, uh, it's uh, a v V11 version 11 is coming out soon. It's coming out this month. Uh, it's going to be towards the end of the month, but uh, version 11 will be coming out this month. I know that because I have a deadline to get some digital woodcarver stuff over to Vetric, uh, and I got to get it over to them in the next couple of days so they can uh, have it ready to launch with the with the new launch of version 11 uh, tool databases and uh, post processors and our machine types and all. There's going to be some very cool features, uh, new features in version 11, and when it comes out, I will uh, be doing a class on all the new features, uh, kind of showing them off. But of course, Vetric has uh, will be putting out a video on what's new with version 11. So, but it will be coming in. Okay, it will be coming uh, soon. All right, let's see here. Uh, Brooks says, "Okay, to get an ISO view of the component in my 3D model, does that component need to export as an STL model and?" Uh, and that's how I don't import it. In ISO view, uh, isometric view of that, um, you're only going to have a limited number of views. So uh, basically, let's grab a model here. Ta -dum -dum -dum. Let's size this model up. And uh, in our window, uh, you know, you're going to have uh, your isometric view is this view here. Um, you've got, uh, you know, your straight on view, your flat view along the X, and then the flat view along the Y. Uh, to get multiple views or anything is not possible in the Vetric software. Um, so if you were trying to create kind of a isometric view, uh, you would have to import this model um, no I wouldn't be able to do that anyway if I had um, if I had multiple views no matter what uh, whatever view I'm on is what view it's going to be on so I can't turn one up on its side and one backwards and one this and one that uh, so uh, when you're talking, you're talking about a draftsman's print of an isometric view where we have a front view, side view, and uh, perspective view and stuff. Um, you're not going to get that multi view in Vetric. Okay, uh, your multi views are basically uh, individual views that you can view uh, separately, but you're not going to get the isometric view. Okay. All right, so um, I will provide the link to these magnets, uh, this 200 pack. Uh, it's the best bang I found from a buck. Uh, it uh, you know um, that can arrive within a you know few short days and stuff. Uh, 200 pack, uh, you know, a quantity of two because every one of them are going to get used, and it's very important that we know the. Um, polarity you know when we put that bit into our hole and you know glue it in or uh, you know uh, epoxy in or whatever the case may be we need to make sure that the uh, polarity of the magnet those faces you know where they stick together and they don't repel each other or else the letter won't stick to the board right so it's very important that's the one thing and you're gonna you've got over you know uh, 300 and something magnets you're gonna be working with uh, and uh, it could be easy to lose track right so uh, Take your time when doing that if you do end up making something like this uh, you know uh, for your game room or kids room or whatever uh, it'd be fun um, but uh, kool-aid says I'm getting multiple tool path mark tool marks uh, while V carving uh, letters lately any suggestions to fix well um, if uh, you are referring to raised letters where you're carving and pocketing around them I'm gonna always recommend to do a raster cut, cutting with the grain versus an offset cut. That offset cut that's going around and around and around and around those letters and all, we're going with the grain against the grain, with the grain against the grain, and we're gonna get tool marks. Now, if you're referring to, um, uh, if you're V carving letters inward, 
and you're getting tool marks in the letters. I've never seen that, um, you know, uh, and stuff uh, that's that's usually caused by chatter or, you know, a bit that's not sharp. So, uh, you know, it may be time to replace that bit uh, and stuff, but I've never seen uh, really in, in many V cars, I haven't seen uh, many tool marks inside letters, you know, V cut letters, uh, unless you're, you're chattering, uh, which means you're, bit can't remove the material fast enough and it can't keep up with the feed rate, your feed rate's too fast and the bit's not spinning fast enough to remove that material, then it's chattering, right? It's chattering and it's creating tool marks inside that cut. That would be the only time I see, uh, you know, inside there or a dull bit where it's actually tearing through the material, again, gonna cause a little chatter there uh, and not shearing through it. But when you're talking about carving on the outside of letters and you're pocketing around it and everything, you know, for those raised letters, uh, if you're getting tool marks, you know, for that where, where it's doing that offset cut around, do it as a raster cut all day long. I recommend it as a raster uh, with that, uh, how that goes. So that would be my answer to that, Coley. All right, so uh, going back, and I'm going to uh, pull this over here to the left side so I can see it a little bit better. Um, let's see here. we got our triple word, then we're going to skip three for a double letter. Hold down that control key, one, two, three. Uh, and then our triple word in the corner here. Oops, and I didn't snap that one to the center. Make sure you snap, grab them by the center and snap to the center. And if you don't have smart snapping and geometry snapping, these two icons at the top turned on, turn them on. Uh, it's gonna be a, a, you know, a, a, a blessing for you if you do, because you wanna be able to just snap right to the center and all. Um, now, uh, from here, we got uh, double words. So one, two, three, four, a triple letter, and a double word. Oh, not a double word, double letter. I gotta fix that down below. Double letter there, let me delete this, and I'm just gonna grab this one. There we go. All right, so uh, getting the board laid out, getting the board laid out. Um, unfortunately, you know, I can mirror and 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 I can mirror and flip and all this stuff and all to mirror these, but then my letters would be backwards and I'd have to mirror them and it's just an extra step. It's just easier to go through and kind of drag and drop. That's why I have everything kind of laid out here that I can just hold my control key down and, um, you know, just start, uh, um, working the board around uh, where I need it and stuff. And so our triple word lines up here and there's gonna be another one up there. All right, didn't snap to the center of that. I wanna snap to the center of that rectangle, there we go. And of course I held the shift key and not the control key, so let's do that again, there we go. Uh, double letter, let's might as well bring that up because it's almost mirrored. And um, the same thing, I was holding the shift key. Let me put my double letter here and my triple word. I'm holding a copy, hold that control key. I don't wanna lose my masters over here. Um, but uh, one, two, three, and then hold that control key, triple word. And then literally, you know, it's kind of just uh, build it up, right? So one, two, oops, that one didn't snap to the center. I'll go back and fix it. Three, four. Fix that. And then a triple letter. And then a double letter. Right, and it's pretty much uh, the same all the way across. We have some others that we got to fill in in here in just a moment, but I'm just getting my around the board um, laid out. So skip two squares, double letter. Triple goes in line with the star. One, two, three. And then All right, so 
I just need one more double letter here. Okay, so that takes care of all four sides. Now I'm just going to, uh, let's grab, oh, I did it again. Hold on a second. Master over there. Double word, there's four of them. One, two, three, four. Triple letter. I wanted to have all this laid out for you guys, but I wanted to be able to do some of it while we were uh, taking questions and stuff. All right, so a majority of the board is done. Now I just have the uh, triple letter and double letter uh, boxes here and um, kind of this pyramid shape and that will complete the layout of the board. While that uh, comes in, um, Brooks Martin, I've seen what is uh, what is kind of a double vision on my uh, skins. Uh, the loose axis coupler uh, was the problem. Uh, so double letter, right? Uh, basically, where you're you're carving one area, uh, it's kind of a shadow effect where you carve in one area, and then all of a sudden, you know, you lose your steps, and, and it carves another area, and it's like moved. Those steps were lost. They could have been lost by hitting a limit and not realizing it, running into a clamp, getting hung up. Uh, you know a communication error between your computer and your machine or your drive or whatever you know your system calls for but it's lost its steps in one axis or another and now it's carving creating kind of a double a shadow effect if you will uh, and things like that and that's a loss of steps uh, so in your case it was um, you know a, uh, a coupler problem right you were losing steps in that so in that axis very good uh, let's see here triple letter um, so this one we uh, come down one two and up one and let me grab it and snap it to the center there and then diagonally from there we have and daggummit I keep holding that shift key instead of that uh, control key um, from there we have three double letters so control uh, we're going diagonally one two, three, and another triple letter. Make sure you take the time uh, to make sure everything is centered. Um, once again, uh, triple letter score, let's do it down here. So over two and up one, get that thing centered. And uh, Double letter score, hold that. I'm gonna grab it in the center. It's important to grab it in the center, but we got one, two, three, and then I'll just take this and copy it over here. All right, cool. Uh, now I could very easily, um, you know, on these here, I could hold down and select my uh, hold down my control or uh, hold down my shift key and select all of them double click on it and grab it in the middle here and drag a copy holding the control key down I could drag a copy over to here uh, and pretty much hit the number zero on my keyboard uh, 90 degrees right and um, then I could pull this into place right to uh, to, to lay that out and once again, if I hold my control, I've got them still selected, might as well work my way around to this last one, drag it over here, hit the number zero key to rotate in 45 degree increments. And then I'm gonna grab the center of the DL and get that centered. Uh, so it centers all the others, right? And that finishes off the board, yay. So these are all gonna be V carved and stuff. Our individual rectangles and everything, um, I'm pretty much using them as uh, uh, to help me to to help me lay out this area and stuff. But I want I'm going to use a V bit and do a profile cut, cutting on the line because I'm basically just going to create a little outline grid, a shallow cut, maybe a sixteenth of an inch deep or what have you, a shallow cut outlining all these rectangles. And I don't want my V bit to go around all four sides, all four sides, all four sides, and do that you know two hundred twenty five times. 
so what I'm going to do is um, I want to create some lines that uh, I can uh, utilize uh, for my tool pass. Uh, the rectangles were great in there for my, um, my layout uh, and everything to help me snap those letters uh, to the center of those rectangles and things. Uh, but now I've got to think smart about tool pathing. Uh, I just want my V-bit to cut nice profile cuts, you know, profile line cuts and everything. Um, I don't want it having to go around every single rectangle to carve that outline, right? Um, okay. The tilt is wrong. All right, I see what you're saying. I see what you're saying. Okay, so basically all the letters should be vertical. Uh, no problem. All letters should be vertical. Uh, we're gonna grab the, um, we're not gonna grab anything. We're gonna grab the letter and change it. Uh, so I'm just gonna, Use the number nine key, one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two. I'm hitting the nine key twice. Uh, over here, uh, number nine key, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. Kinda sucks for the other players that their words are upside down. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh, one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. All right, let's go over here. And all of those are vertical. So everything is vertical and orientated properly. Thank you, uh, Blue Knight. Very cool. Um, uh, for uh, correcting me on that, because that would have sucked. I'd have sent that out to everybody and it'd been backwards. Uh, and I'm sitting here looking, I got a sample right here. I don't know why I didn't pay attention to that, but uh, I didn't pay attention to that. Interesting. Okay. All right, so uh, very good. And that rotate tool, the number nine key is uh, counterclockwise in 45 degree increments, and the number zero key is clockwise in 45 degree increments, right? So very helpful in something like that. We had a bunch of letters that we had to correct. Uh, and rather than redoing them at all, we just go and select and hit that nine key couple times or zero key whichever way we wanted to turn them and uh, done right cool all right now uh, let's go ahead and uh, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna create a new layer this is where layers come in handy and uh, on this layer I'm gonna call this my uh, grid lines and I'm gonna make this layer uh, red okay uh, the other layers I'm going to lock them let me do it over in the layers tool it's much easier so uh, let's lock that one lock that one lock 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 and this one we can delete. That's where that world's greatest papa, we can delete that. Okay. And so by locking those layers, uh, what I've done is uh, made it where I can't select, it's you know my template or whatever. I can't select it, I can't move it, I can't do anything. Um, and uh, it's protected from me screwing it up. Um, the dimensions layer does not need to be locked. Let me unlock that so I can delete that dimension. All right, let me delete that layer. Okay, so now with my grid lines layer active, I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna draw a uh, line, draw a line, and I'm gonna draw a line across the bottom here from here to here, space bar to finish the line. Okay, you can see that red line there. And I'm gonna go ahead and draw a line from here this corner up to the top of this corner space bar to finish 
All right, with this line here uh, selected, I'm going to use my array tool. I'm gonna use my array tool and uh, I want one row, 15 columns, uh, with a gap of 1.5 inches uh, along that X axis, uh, none along the Y, because I'm not going up. And I wanna copy those over to get all of my grid lines across. And um, I needed 16, not 15. Uh, let me undo that real quick. Select that and I need 16. There we go, okay. And then the same thing uh, with this grid line down here. Uh, it's gonna be 16 rows with one column. Again, uh, zero on the X, but I want one and a half inch spacing because that's how big my squares are. Uh, and uh, copy those up. And now I've got my vector lines for my tool pathing, okay? Now, um, when it comes to the uh, tool pathing, what I'd like to do is I want to make things easier on myself uh, because I want my um, bit to uh, carve in the order that um, I select those vectors. So what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to step back one step and control Z. So I have all of my vertical uh, vectors here and I can select them. Remember my other layers are locked so it won't select any of those. And I want to move them to their own layers. And uh, I'm going to move them to a new layer. And I'm going to call this my uh, vertical, vert grid lines. Cool beans. And then um, that way I can, uh, let's do my horizontal ones now. And while they're selected, I'm gonna go ahead and move them to a new layer and call them horizontal grid lines. And uh, this way I can uh, come in and close that. Let's make this red. Uh, I can go in and turn those layers off when I'm creating the tool pass. Now on these layers currently right now, um, I'm gonna go ahead and turn off the horizontal grid lines. Actually, I'm an idiot. I'm not, I'm not gonna turn it off. Um, yeah, I am, I'm gonna turn it off. And I'm gonna select these lines uh, from left to right, so one at a time, I'm just gonna kind of select them from left to right. And we're gonna do a profile cut and I'm gonna cut a 16th of an inch deep, 0.0625, uh, with a 60 degree V-bit, that'll be good, 60 degree V-bit. on the line. Uh, for the start at, uh, I want to uh, keep the uh, start points, but I would like to, uh, you know, back and forth, I'd like to optimize this cut a little bit. And um, the, uh, uh, cut, if I, if I choose to optimize the start points, then it's gonna cut here, come down and cut here, come up here and cut here, come down and cut here. Otherwise, I could physically do that by going into node editing mode on every other line and changing the start point. So when I calculate this tool path, I wanna go up, over, down, over, up, over, down, over, up, over, and all. It's gonna be a much more optimized cut instead of cutting coming back to the next line, cutting, cutting back to the next line, cutting, coming back to the next line. So the option I chose uh, in the start at was optimize the start points, right? You know, optimize it for me, uh, speed it up. If I would have kept the current start points and calculated that, then it would have carved, come all the way back to the beginning, carved, come all the way back to the beginning, carved, come all the way back to the beginning. That increases my runtime, right? So we want to start at, 
optimize the start points and that'll reduce the runtime. Now, how much time does that save us uh, actually? Let's 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 take a look at that. Um, uh, and it really can't calculate, uh, you know, our, the transitions and stuff. But if I kept the current start points and all, uh, the runtime on this is about 16 minutes. Okay. If I optimize the start points and everything, uh, the runtime is about 13 minutes. So I shave three minutes off, right? So not bad. You know, every little bit helps. All right. Now, um, uh, with that, I've got those lines uh, uh, created. Let's go back and see what we have on uh, questions. Um, lower left TV, lower left TW looks out of center to me by Roy. I think you're right, Roy. So lower left. Let me unlock that layer. What layer are you on there, boys? There we go. You were right. This one's low too. Check them all while I'm here. Come on now, wake up. Zoom into that one. This one's fighting with me. Wake up. Wake up. There we go. Took a minute. Holy cow. Um, yeah. So. I'll go through and make sure all of them are all centered and everything uh, before I create anything. All right, so uh, with the uh, horizontal uh, grid lines done, I can go in and turn that layer off. Um, and I'm sorry, with the verticals done, I can turn that layer off and turn my horizontal on, my horizontal vectors. And uh, with those layers locked, let me lock these others back. Make sure they're all locked. Yep. And I can get rid of this one. All right, with those locked and all, I can just go ahead and select all this and only select those vertical lines or horizontal lines. I keep getting my horizontal and vertical screwed up. Again, same uh, profile cut here. Uh, 16th of an inch on the line, start at, optimize the start points, calculate that toolpath. Uh, so I get that back and forth motion, back and forth motion and all. Uh, and now we um, preview that visible toolpath. And so we've got our grid here, right? Now I need to get, because this is going to be a double-sided job. My magnets are coming in through the back, okay? I, I don't want uh, the magnets going in through the front. I want them coming in through the back and uh, uh, because I'm going to be carving my letters in the front and stuff, but I need to make sure I drill deep enough, uh, you know, for my magnet to go in that I'm still going to get good continuity, right? I'm still going to get uh, good polarity uh, and uh, connection uh, with those magnets. And those ne neodymium magnets, they're pretty tough uh, and they're kind of designed, you know, uh, they're, they're, you know, they're great for uh, doing things uh, like that. I don't know why I pulled my sleeves down. They're great for doing things like that. Um, like if I was making a knife rack, I could, you know, put uh, the magnets on the back side and then the knives stick to the front side kind of thing and all kinds of fun stuff. So what I want to do here is uh, I need to draw a circle and my magnets are six millimeter by three millimeter. And uh, so that's going to be uh, 
about 0.27 inches. Um, the the um, uh, diameter, basically 0 0.23622 22 inches, uh, 0.23. And then uh, the three millimeter is gonna be 0 0.118, uh, 11. Um, but uh, so a quarter inch hole is gonna be perfect. And I need to, uh, let's get a quarter inch diameter there. Okay, uh, right in the center. And I wanna put that on its own layer. And of course, I drew it on a layer that was locked, ID5. Once I drew it, it locked it in and wouldn't let me uh, select that. I wanna put it on its own layer, move to its a new layer, and I'm gonna call this my magnet holes. Okay, uh, click. Let's give them, we'll make them green. <clears throat> okay. Uh, I want to create my array, my linear array. Uh, so the uh, this is going to be 15 rows and 15 columns of this. And now the gap between uh, the gap between is basically the space between each one of these. And so I'm going from you know center to center. So if I I'll take my control key here for a second and snap to the center of this the gap is actually from the right side of one object to the left side of the other, right? So um, if I were to measure that horizontally uh, from the right side, well, from this node here to the left side, uh, we're at an inch and a quarter, okay? Uh, so that's what my gap is going to be. Let's close this tool get rid of that so uh, with that selected we're going to open up our array tool and uh, we want uh, one and a quarter by one and a quarter on the x and the y lord have mercy there we go and uh, go ahead and copy that across so that lays out the uh, magnet holes all right cool beans and uh, while they're selected, I'm gonna go ahead and group them together. And I'm actually gonna, I don't want them on the front side here. I'm going to move them to the other side. But if you notice, when I set this job up earlier, I didn't set it up as a two-sided job. So I need to do that. I need to set it up as a two-sided job. So uh, let's go back to our job setup, origin and dimensions. This is gonna be a two-sided job. I will be referencing off the material surface on both sides. I will be starting from the bottom left corner and I will flip it along my Y axis, okay? Uh, for me, the Y axis is basically top to bottom. And uh, I'm gonna click OK, and I'm gonna come in here and select these holes, and I'm actually going to move them to the other side, okay? So it puts them on the other side, so when I flip over, I've got my magnet holes. Right now, I need to determine how deep my V bit is going to cut my letters here. Um, and the letters, uh, this particular Arial font, the letters are pretty much consistent width. Um, so the depth of cut is going to be pretty much consistent all the way across. Uh, so um, let's go in here and. Uh, I'm done with, uh, oh, sorry, I have the hiccups. I'm done with the layers being locked, so let's unlock those all. Okay, so what I wanna do here is I actually wanna just do a V-carve sample. Uh, I'm gonna use a V-carve, and this is gonna tell me if I'm gonna use a 60 degree V-bit or a 22 degree V-bit or a 90 degree V-bit, you know, I'll determine the depth of cut, you know, based on what what my cut is. I'm gonna start off with a 60 degree V-bit. Uh, so we'll go in and grab that bit. And um, I'm gonna calculate that tool path. And I'm gonna pull into that. Just 
so I can preview that selected tool path. And if I move my mouse uh, into that um, cut, I've got some pixelation. Always turned up. I've got some distorted pixelation. Uh, Kind of zoom out till I find a clean area to measure. So with the 60 degree V bit, it's only cutting about uh, a little less than a sixteenth of an inch deep, uh, 0 0.0569. Now I'm going to change that to a 22 degree V bit, and let's see what we get uh, with that. And I must have shadow shading or something turned on. Bear with me a second. Uh, what do I have on my views here? Nope, none of those. It's really, really distorted. You see that distortion there? That is an anomaly. Let me turn my quality down for a minute and see if that changes anything because my yeah I've got some distortion there. I gotta figure out what that is. That's a glitch. That is not anything to do with the toolpath or the vector. It's a glitch. And I gotta figure out where that glitch is because it looks like a shadow cut. Yeah. Stand by one moment. Material surface is at the top. Vector is clean. Yeah, I got some kind of anomaly in my VCAR Pro. I have to figure that one out. I don't have an answer for that one. But anyway, let's uh, look at my cut depth here. Um, it's about uh, 3 16ths, uh, you know, 0.1875, it's 0.1894, uh, uh, 3 16ths of an inch deep with the, um, the uh, 22 degree V bit uh, versus about a 16th of an inch deep with the, um, the 60 degree V bit. Uh, I'm gonna go with a 60 degree V bit because I want a shallower cut. Um, Am I gonna go with the 60 degree V bit? Bear with me a second here. My pocket cut comes. Yeah, I'm gonna go with the 60 degree V bit because my magnet, I gotta have some material underneath the V cut to where the pocket hole of the magnet comes in. You know, I don't wanna bust through my letters and all. So I am gonna use the 60 degree V bit on this. Uh, and that's why there was my anomaly right here at a flat depth of a 16. I had a flat depth right here. That shouldn't be there. That's what that anomaly was. It was a user error. <laughs> uh, we'll talk about that in just a second. Let's go back to our 60 and recalculate that. Preview that uh, selected tool path. Nope, I still have that anomaly. That's because I'm on the wrong side of the board.
That cut? No, that's that's an anomaly. Bear with me a second. Let me turn off. There we go. Much better. I had the uh, toggle both sides view on, and it was showing me both sides. I was like, wait a minute. That looks screwy. Uh, this is just pixelation here. But uh, with that depth of cut, uh, I'm cutting about... Um, what bit am I using? Let's go back to the 60, not the 22. We'll get it here. Here we go. Uh, with that cut of depth, I'm cutting about a 16th of an inch, a little more than a 16th, and that's good for me uh, because on the other side, you know, of this, um, and let's now I can toggle on that view so I can see it. Uh, on the other side of that cut, I'm going to be doing a either a drilling or a pocket. On this case, it's going to be a drilling. Um, it uh, it'll be fine uh, as a drilling tool path with a quarter inch end mill, and uh, I'm going to be cutting down. So my board, I I don't plan on if this is a three quarter inch board, that's fine. Um, I did kind of uh, plan on uh, possibly making this out of plywood. Uh, I haven't decided that yet, or it could be solid wood, uh, a panel glued up. Um, but if I did, I probably, I'd, I wouldn't want to waste a whole lot of material. If it was plywood, I'd go with half inch because I don't need it to be very thick. If it's hardwood, I don't want to have to sit there and mill all my lumber down to half inch and waste all that material um, and everything. So I'd go with a three quarter inch panel uh, and all. Uh, that, that one I haven't really thought all the way through, but uh, in this case, let's assume that we're going three quarters of an inch. Uh, so if I have a three quarter inch thick piece of material and my letters on the other side are carving to a sixteenth of an inch or a little more than a sixteenth of an inch, we'll call it 0.17, uh, then I and I want to leave a little bit of material at the bottom of my cut uh, for the uh, uh, drilling operation um, I'm going to uh, make sure there's a little bit of meat there so here I'm gonna go 0.75 minus point um, Point oh 0.09 so close to about a 30 second of skin there that'll be good either 0.9 or 0.1 but let's go 0.9 equals so that's my depth of cut 0.66 now in this one I do want to attract retract above the cutting depth to pull that material out but I actually want to kind of clean the bottom out because I'm going to be pushing this magnet all the way down to the bottom of that hole and I want it to sit flat. So I am going to have my drilling toolpath just dwell for a few seconds at the bottom of the cut. It's going to extend that run time a little bit, but I want to dwell because I really want to kind of clean out that bottom. Okay, so I'm going to have it uh, dwell for about, um, you know, uh, three seconds. And that cut is going to be on all of these. So we'll calculate that. Okay. So it'll go through and drill those holes. That's going to be the back of the board. Uh, and then the front of the board. We're going to, uh, I wish I would have, I didn't think ahead of time. I didn't put my rectangles. On their own layer um, so I need to go through and select these letters individually I could have just selected everything uh, without selecting the rectangles um, but I did not put them on their own layer so I'm drawing a box making sure that the letters are a hundred percent in that box but I am not uh, making sure that my boxes are not 100% in that box so it doesn't select them. So I'm only selecting the letters, uh, the things I want to V-carve. So holding that shift key down, 
uh, to keep adding each row to the next, but making sure when I draw a box around it that only my letters are 100% in that box. Uh, and as long as my rectangles aren't, I won't select them. You know. Okay, so with that, I can group those together now just uh, so it makes it easier to select next time. I can just click on the group, right? Uh, and this V carve uh, here, um, the word score, and all of this over here is going to get V carved to the same. And I'm using a 60 degree V bit for it all, so um, I can. Uh, just keep that 60 there and calculate that toolpath. Okay, uh, I'm going to be, you know, um, painting these uh, letters. I'm going to probably, you know, paint them black or what have you so they stand out and all that wonderful stuff. Uh, preview those visible toolpaths. So my grid lines and all. Oops. It would help if I had a cut depth in there, right? So that would be good. Usually when something doesn't isn't right, there's something wrong, right? There's a setting wrong and all that. 90% of the time, 90% of the time, uh, you know, issues that, you know, uh, that we, we, we do, it's, it's literally user error, right? It's, it's um, you know, I didn't uh, make sure that my, my TWs were centered in my box so everything got carved off center or I forgot to put a cut depth in so it's not previewing properly or whatever the case may be, right? So a lot of times we have to kind of check ourselves and say, hey, something's going wrong. Let's go back and just look at everything, right? Now for the chalk area, uh, like I said, this is going to get painted with a couple of coats. It's going to get a primer coat uh, and then it's going to get some chalk paint uh, in there so we can use it like a little chalkboard. Um, Sorry, I don't know that one. Alexa, stop. I'm going to pull this up because we're going to put a tray. Uh, we're going to glue a tray here and we'll make that tray on a separate piece of material and all. But in here, I'm thinking about pocketing down uh, just a little bit, kind of to create a little level, you know, a little bit of a level there. So uh, this pocket here, because these are going to be, these tiles are going to be individual cut tiles right here. Uh, and they're going to get magnets as well. I got to put the circles and the magnet holes in there, but they're going to be magneted. Magneted on there, or they'll probably get glued because that's going to stay permanently. That's just, you know, uh, it'll probably get glued on versus magnet. So, yeah, we'll do that. And then we still got to lay out and cut our tiles, and we're done for the night, guys. I know this is long, but now we're going to take a pause from here. So, we've got our tool pass laid out, except for this one gets deleted. And let's go back to a QA for a minute. And again, uh, I'm going to create all this uh, and uh, give you guys. Um, you know. All right, let's see here. Um, check the DW near the star. Everybody's like, say, check the D, the DL need the st near the star. They're centered there. That's center. That one's centered. And that one's centered. So there's those are centered, the DLs. Okay. Uh, let's see here. Check the DW near the star. Big Daddy Fish, what DW near the star? Let me know. All right, let's see here. Um, what 
Brooks Martin, you're asking uh, any insight. Um, uh, are you talking about version 11 or are you still talking about uh, the isometric view? Uh, you're not going to be able to do an isometric view again in the Vetric software. Um, so uh, one of the things that, uh, you know, one of the things that you could do is um, when you are in your 3D view, let's say I'm at a perspective view here, uh, I can use either my snip tool down here uh, to um, snip out an image. I'd probably have a white background because I'd be gluing this on a piece of paper, right? Um, but uh, to, you know, that image and all, and then I could bring it into, I could import those images into kind of a Word document to create an isometric PDF and all. If I were going to do that, if I were going to do that, I'd go in and change my background uh, color um, to a solid color and I would change it to white. Okay, uh, so that way I can uh, come in with my computer's snip tool, do a rectangular snip uh, to pull that image out, and then I could save that image uh, as, uh, we'll just call it uh, Capture 1, close that, uh, come into a straight view, Again, use my snip tool, my computer's snip tool. Uh, grab that. There's something going on with my straight on view. It looks uh, distorted, but um, uh, save as, uh, we'll call this capture two. Uh, and then a flat view really doesn't do me any justice on this because it's not a 3D model but I could do that flat view. And then I would come into like a Word document. Insert an image. Lay that out, insert another image. Change uh, the way they merge with one another. Well, it would help if I didn't overwrite my other image. Hold on a second, insert picture. Change the way that interacts. Oh, let's see here. Let me get rid of that shading. Okay. So then I could write, you know, whatever I wanted to write or whatever, and I have this kind of ISO view, right? So that would be my insight.
Okay. All right. Let's go back. Um, what was the website you mentioned in the past where it shows you how your letters look in that font? Wordmark.it. Word mark w o r d m a r k dot i t word market uh, it helps you choose your fonts um, so word mark dot i t and uh, in word market you can type in a phrase a sentence a word uh, and it will show you that phrase, sentence, or word with all of the fonts that are installed on your computer. Wordmark.it. Cool. Um, as far as uh, insights on uh, V11, um, let me see. As far as insights on V11, bear with me again. Second, son of a gun. We'll get it here, guys. Turn my green screen off so I could open up this. back down here there we go uh, so uh, there's gonna be um, some uh, most likely in uh, Aspire or what have you but uh, there's gonna be multi-sheet support uh, which um, it will uh, help you organize your work through the new sheet management tab uh, there's going to be 3D rest machining, optimizing uh, machining time, uh, material removal and all. So we talked about rest machining in Aspire. I believe this is going to be just an Aspire function uh, and everything. Um, uh, but uh, they have actually added an actual rest machining toolpath. They've turned it from a way that you can work around to create that to an actual way that you can create it. Uh, 3D segmenting. Uh, sometimes when you bring in a 3D model, it has a lot of under meat and everything. You'll be able to break that model up into sections and segment it out so you can cut it out in parts to assemble together. Uh, new sculpting brush features. Um, uh, so there's going to be uh, a, lot of, a lot of new stuff in the modeling and all. Um, but I don't, that, uh, pretty much that's all the insight I have right now. Uh, based on a newsletter that was sent out to OEMs. Uh, but once it comes out, uh, I'll do a class on all the features. And then Vetric, of course, they'll put out a video before me on uh, what's new and everything. So the uh, uh, we'll go from there. All right, let's see here. Uh,
This looks like it would work well as a laser project also. Yeah, uh, Big Daddy Fish, uh, this would work very well as a laser project. Absolutely well as a laser project. Um, a very well, oh, yes, yes. Um, you're welcome, guys. Uh, yes, it would look very nice as a, as a laser project for sure. Uh, and everything. Um, and all. What's weird is my view. Let me see what's going on with my view here. There we go. Um, so this is the board layout. And then we were talking about, before we went on, uh, we were talking about this area here. I would most likely do this as a pocket cut uh, and just cut a shallow pocket, maybe about a sixteenth of an inch deep. Um, and uh, uh, it's, I'd probably use a quarter inch end mill. That's gonna give me radius corners and I'm fine with that. I have no problem with that whatsoever because this is just a scoreboard area. So a uh, quarter inch end mill and uh, I would do it as an offset to optimize the cut. Um, and uh, if I was, uh, you know, getting, um, let me get rid of this eighth inch end mill here. Calculate. Um, if I was uh, doing this as a, what am I trying to say here? Um, I don't know what I'm trying to say, guys. There was something I wanted to say to that effect, but uh, uh, the radius I'm not uh, concerned about because it's just a scoreboard area. But this area would get painted with uh, chalkboard paint, so a nice little way to uh, you know create chalkboard. And the last thing I want to do before we wrap up tonight is I want to create a little chalkboard tray here, and then I want to talk about uh, cutting out uh, these uh, tiles and you know the magnets and all because we still got to nest them real quick. So very quickly, uh, I wanna open up a new window, uh, a new VCAR 10 window here. And on this window, I'm going to, uh, let's go back to the other window for a second and see what size I need. Oh, what size do I want? So five and three quarters, five and three quarters uh, by oh, two inches. So one by four will be fine. So let's come over here and uh, we'll just go uh, three and a half by 10 inches by three quarter, click OK. And here, this is going to, uh, we're gonna make a little chalkboard tray. So uh, the chalkboard tray is gonna be five and three quarters, 5.75. And um, I want it to be about, I don't know, a half inch wide. So 0.5 by 5.75. There we go. All right, I'm just going to use a line here, a line tool, and I'm going to draw a line there. And I'm only gonna have one of these. Uh, so I could, you know, if I had other projects that I was doing so I'm not wasting wood, I'm either gonna cut my board down to a smaller size or I'm gonna throw other projects, other cutouts or whatever else I'm doing over here uh, so I'm not wasting wood uh, and stuff. But just as an example, uh, the line cut would be a profile cut uh, and I'm gonna cut about a quarter of an inch deep with a box core bit. I can run down to Lowe's 
and grab like a 3 8 inch or half inch diameter box core bit um, and uh, that's going to create that groove for me for my chalk to uh, lay in you know and quarter inch is a bit deep let's go it, it just needs a small groove so let's go an eighth of an inch deep There we go. And uh, then I'm gonna do a profile cut, uh, cutting all the way through the material, three quarters of an inch thick, uh, on the outside of the line with a quarter inch end mill. I'm not gonna do tabs, because I'm just gonna use, this is a small piece, so I'm just gonna use two-sided tape You know, um, and so this part, this will be my chalkboard tray, and this will just get glued, attached right to the face of the other project, right? So just a nice little box core bit groove for the chalk, uh, and then this will get face glued uh, right here. Uh, so the thickness of uh, my box here, uh, I'm actually going to come down a little bit with that it's going to be the thickness of my material, right? So the height is gonna be uh, 0.75, and uh, the width is going to be five and three quarters. Okay, and if I wanted to, I'm gluing it in, right? Uh, I could create a little pocket, a little recess, you know, to glue it into so I know exactly where to go with it. Uh, and if I did that, it would be a shallow pocket, but I want to put fillets on here, right? So I get those nice corners, so it'd be almost like a nice fit. Um, and I would overcut this just ever so slightly, so it, it's a nice fit. So what I mean by that is I'm going to go to my fillet tool, and since I'm using a quarter inch end mill, I'll use an eighth inch uh, fillet, and it's not going to be a normal fillet, it's going to be a dog bone fillet. Uh, and uh, throw a little fillet here. Okay, or I could just face glue it, right? I could just mark where it goes and face glue it on if I didn't want to carve this little pocket, but I'm just giving you some examples. Uh, this would be a pocket cut. Um, uh, hell, just a literally like a 32nd of an inch deep. Uh, 0.03125. Uh, using a quarter inch end mill and uh, using an offset and uh, pocket allowance, I want it to overcut by a few thousandths of an inch. So I'm gonna go 0 0.002, and it's gonna be a negative number. We talked about this uh, earlier. It's gonna be a negative number. I wanna overcut that vector. Let's go into a solid view here. I wanna overcut that vector just by a few thousandths of an inch, just to make it bigger so my part fits in there, right? So it's not such a tight fit. So it's a negative number. When I want to go over the line in a 2D cut, it's a negative offset, boundary offset. When I want to go away from the line, more inside my pocket area here, that's a positive cut. Uh, and that's the same way profile, pocket, you know, any 2D cut, it's that way. But with the 3D model, positive number goes over the line, negative number goes away from the line. So it's, it's, it's reversed. So I'd have this little, um, you know, uh, recess cut there uh, to um, uh, cut that out er that area out there uh, so I can just glue my part in and of course yeah I'm gonna see my little fillets you know I'll see my little fillets there and I'm not really worried about that if you're worried about that just face glue it right you just measure and mark right yeah you know we all um, know how to do that stuff now and let's talk about tiles and everything. So I'm actually going to grab these tiles here and drag them down here. Um, each of these tiles, including the two blanks, right there, including the two blanks. Uh, and I also have some bonus tiles over here um, and all. Uh, we'll, grab, we'll throw those into the mix over there. All of these are going to get cut out of a, uh, you know, either one, two, or three different sheets of material. Uh, and, uh, but it, uh, with the case of this, with these tiles and all, I probably, 
um, only make them at the most a half inch thick. I'm thinking more three eighths inch thick because I don't want a whole lot of weight to them. They're, I mean, mind you, they're only an inch and a half by an inch and a half, right? But I don't want a whole lot of weight to them uh, and everything. Uh, and so on these cuts, uh, we're going to, I'm actually gonna copy these. Copy. And I'm gonna open up a, another Vetric window because I'm gonna do it on a small, much smaller board. And I would probably do these out of a long narrow board, but we gotta we gotta have a certain amount of number of tiles and all. Because that's that's not all the tiles. You know, there's a certain there's nine A's, there's two B's, there's you know, things like that. So uh, first things first, let's get uh, a board laid out here. I'm gonna go probably about uh, 24 inches long and uh, possibly a, a, let's go seven and a quarter, one by eight. And uh, I'm actually gonna go three eighths of an inch thick. So I'll most likely resaw a board so I have two halves uh, and then run it through the planer uh, to get it down to the three eighths inch thick. So I have another board that I can use for other things uh, without wasting material or I'll just run it through a planer and eat that material, right? Either way, uh, whatever you have in your shop uh, allows you to do what you gotta do. All right, let's go ahead and uh, paste our vectors in here. And we've gotta really quickly, very quickly, uh, we've gotta create all of our number tiles and everything. Now, in my other design, I have our uh, letter distribution here, which uh, basically, uh, Tells me how many letters of each tile there should be for the game. And so I'll paste that over here. So I need nine A's, okay? So literally I'm just going to select A and hold down the control key and drag out one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Two B's. two C's, holding down that control key. I don't care where they lay at in here because we're gonna be uh, nesting them onto the material. Uh, let's see here, four D's. One, two, three, four total there. E's, there's 12 of them. Let me move these tiles out of my way. There's 12 E's. So, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. And do not have your letters. If you're going to lay them out, don't matter how they lay out, just don't make them overlap one another because when we nest, the nesting reads that as one object in some cases. So do put some space between them. Uh, let's see here. There should be two Fs. So just copy one more over. Uh, three G's. Two H's. Uh, nine I's. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So that should be nine all together. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Okay. Move those out of my way. Uh, J's, there should be just one J, one K, four L's. Two M's. See, I'm doing all the work for you guys. You're gonna you're gonna get this cool file when it's all said and done. Hopefully, y'all make this. If y'all do, share a picture with me if you make it. Uh, N should be six. One. Oh, don't do that. Six. 
eight O's. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. There we go. Two P's in a pod. Uh, one Q, six R's. I'm holding the control key and just dragging them out and dropping them, dragging and dropping. Um, almost there, guys. S's. We have four S's. One, two, three more here. Okay. That looks like six T's. I can't even read my own writing. Six T's. And U U. <laughs> six T's. We'll fix that U U here in a second. Um, one, two, three, four, five. Wonderful. Um, the. User four, there should be four U's. Uh, let's see here, uh, two V's. Two W's. You should have 100 tiles all together. 98 them of them are word tiles and two of them are gonna be blank tiles. Uh, one X, two Y's, and one Z. Okay, and then our two blanks. All right, so we have our uh, letters up here and again, they're everything separated. On our board, what we're gonna do, and let me fix this uh, really quickly. Uh, go into my text box and change U dash four. There we go. And I'll fix it in the main design as well. I won't forget. Uh, but what I want to do now is I want to select all of my tiles. Okay. Uh, and again, make sure that none of the tiles are overlapping each other. So if they are, Take a second and space them out. Make sure they're not overlapping any other tiles. Okay, go through and make sure, make sure, make sure. All right, cool. All right, select all those and I'm gonna use nesting. Now, if you have Vetric VCarve desktop, uh, you'll have to nest manually, you know, which is uh, pretty uh, straightforward that you can do. Just drag and drag them into place and you can space them. You can create a grid to snap them to whatever you want. But in this case, I'm gonna be using a, um, a quarter inch or an eighth inch end mill, uh, probably a quarter inch end mill to cut them out. Um, actually, no, I'm not. Uh, I'm gonna use a table saw to cut the tiles. Uh, if I were doing, I could do profile cuts to cut every one of them out, but it'd be quicker if I create the grid of these and I just run them through the table saw. So I, I want a, uh, my blade on my table saw is an eighth of an inch. So um, I'm gonna have an eighth of an inch with zero clearance and zero border gap. I'm not gonna rotate to fit. I'm not gonna mirror to fit. Uh, I'm not gonna allow parts inside of other parts and I'm gonna go along the x-axis starting at the bottom left corner. And uh, when I create this, okay, hold on a second. Let me see here. I've got some overlaps. Let me get rid of these overlaps. I don't think my letters touching here should uh, make a difference. Uh, 
I don't think this should make a difference but just in case because it gave me an error and then we're gonna wrap this up guys I know this is the getting the boy the boring part I'm just holding down the down arrow uh, after I select these I'm just holding the down arrow down to kind of uh, drag these out and then we'll get back to some more wrap-up questions Oops. okay so Make sure no tiles are touching and overlapping, right? No tiles are touching and overlapping. Uh, you go this way, you go that way, you go that way. All right, let's try that one more time. See if I get that error again. Um, nesting. Preview. There we go. Okay. So I'll have my spacing here, but I had uh, one little glitch hiccup right here for some reason. No big deal. Um, we'll fix that. And probably could have got those uh, other two tiles on if I made my board a little bit longer. If I instead of 24 inches, if I went like 26 or whatever. But let me fix this right here. I'm gonna select all these and I'm gonna bring them up to there. Okay, because I'm gonna be running my table saw down the edges of these. Okay, and I'm gonna create a, a line or a path. Um, I'm gonna create a line or a path uh, so that I can do at least a little V carve so I can, um, uh, no I'm not, I don't need to do that. I know how to measure my, I know how to set my table saw uh, fence. Okay, so that one's good. And uh, active sheet number two. Uh, this one here is all good except my triple word scores are not the right size that's why they screwed up my little bonus tiles were not the right size so let's get them sized up they should be 1.5 1.5 1 1.5 okay all right let's group that together Alright, so I need to space these out. What I'm going to do is I'm going to snap to here, okay, uh, to this one down here, and then I'm going to drag this up, holding my alternate key so it stays on this line, but I can bring my mouse over to here uh, to align that. Let me do that again. If I select these two and move them up, holding my alternate key it keeps it on this plane so it allows me to move my mouse over to the corner of this board here uh, and when I do that um, let's try that again come on now stay first of all snap to this box there there we go now hold the alternate key 
drag that up and I can move my mouse over there and put it right in the line. And then this last one, hold that alternate key, drag this up, move my mouse over to that one to snap to it and of course grab it on the corner laney. Okay. All right. Take all of this and um, move it down to the corner of my board here. There we go. So I'll be able to cut that, minimize my waste there. And then, of course, I have these other two, uh, which most likely. I'm going to make my board a little bit bigger. And on that other sheet, sheet three, uh, I'd allow me to select those vectors there. And number one, while I'm here, let me just size them up, get those sized up. 1.5, 1.5, those weren't included when we did them earlier. Um, but I can select these now and move them to sheet, and I'm gonna just move them to sheet one. So that way I can go back to sheet one here and uh, Bring them down here. All right, now for this, so I can get my exact spacing and everything of my eighth of an inch, I'm gonna select this and group it together. G for group, guys, G for group, U for ungroup on the keyboard shortcuts. I'm gonna snap it right to the edge of this one and then I'm going to move it relative to its position on the x-axis an eighth of an inch. Click apply. I'm gonna select this one here and snap it. Grab it right on the corner and snap it to this corner. Hold down my alternate key, drag it up and snap to there, okay? All right, so now I've got my tool, uh, my, my boxes laid out here and all that wonderful jazz uh, for all my letters uh, and stuff. And so we're gonna go in here and we're going to ungroup everything on sheet one and sheet two. Wonderful. And now we're gonna set our V carve. So let's select all of our text. Again, if you if your boxes are not in your selection window, it will not select them. So that allows us to select them uh, very easily. We're gonna do a V carve toolpath. Now on this one, my tiles are really small uh, and my letters are much smaller. Um, uh, shoot, I'll probably stick with the 60 degree V bit. Okay, preview the visible toolpath. Yeah, the, these here See how shallow they're coming. Yeah, they're only cutting, the, the those letters are only cutting about 10 thousandths of an inch deep. That's about a 16th, that's good. About 199, 199. All right, what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna give it a start depth. I'm gonna give it another 10 thousandths of an inch. Just to get a little bit more definition out of those, okay? So with that, now I can select my rectangles. And just like uh, before, 
Um, I don't want it to be 100% in the box, right? So when I select, but this time I'm going to go from right to left and I'm just going to touch the boxes. Uh, so when I come from right to left, I'm going to make sure that my mouse is just touching the boxes and not the letters and stuff inside. So right to left, it doesn't have to be inside the box by 100%. It's whatever that box touches. Right, so I'm just drawing a narrow box to select these vectors. Okay, uh, I could group them afterwards so I don't have to do that again, whatever, whatever floats your boat. Um, now, this, if I were profile cutting these out or anything like that, um, they would, uh, you know, they would be spread apart much further right but I'm saw cutting these so the only thing I need to do with these is uh, I want to put a chamfer a chamfer on the edge and let's go back to answer some questions uh, I want to put the reason why I'm selecting those I want to put a chamfer on it but let's go back really quickly and let's see here um, Or take a chisel. Yeah, okay, Big Daddy Fish was talking about those fillets that I put on that rectangle for that uh, chalk holder. Uh, rather than doing the fillets, uh, I could just, uh, you know, I'm going to have radius corners if I did it as a pocket. I could just on my, my small piece and all, I could, uh, you know, uh, round off those corners, right? You know, so they fit and everything. Absolutely. If I got the hand tools and the, the skill to do it, absolutely. Uh, so, um Hey, do you ever deviate from manufacturer's feed and plunge rates? Uh, I never use manufacturer's feed and plunge rates, uh, Brooklyn. Um, I have a set set of uh, uh, feed rates and plunge rates and, uh, uh, and all uh, for the digital woodcarver tool library that I've created for the digital woodcarver customers. Um, and uh, none of those are factory recommendations. Uh, what do you what are you going to do for the oh no what are you going to use for lineup guides so that you flip the letters over so that you flip the letters over um, I'm going to uh, you're talking about alignment pins alignment pins uh, for the back sides of these and everything and he's absolutely right um, what am I going to do for alignment pins well uh, those are going to be quarter inch holes we'll throw one here and one down here so I need to put one on sheet two as well uh, bah, bah, bah. What I'll do is uh, to put them in the same place. So I don't have to drill more than one set of holes uh, in my waste board. I'll copy these. Copy. Uh, go to sheet one. Look how wonderful that is. Uh, paste. Here we go. All right, so that'll be my alignment holes, and uh, they'll get copied. I still got to put my magnet holes in because there's magnets going in the back of these too. Uh, so all of that stuff. Um, but uh, we'll do that in just a second. Uh, let's here. Uh, copy. This job is not set up as a two-sided job. Got to fix that. Double-sided job. Referencing everything is the same as my other double sided job. Okay, so this and this copy to the other side. On sheet two, this and this. Copy to the other side. There we go. All right, so that way I have those holes on the other side there. Okay, 
Uh, let's quickly go back to the chamfer. Um, the chamfer tool path that I was going to do. Uh, on this, uh, when I say chamfer, it's just I'm going to be doing a V carve uh, on this, and um, rather than the actual chamfer tool path, uh, I don't necessarily need to do the chamfer tool path because I'm just going to run a 90 degree V bit on it and uh, uh, run the chamfer on it around all four edges. So it's going to be a profile cut. I'm going to be cutting on the line, uh, but I'm going to be offsetting a little bit. Uh, so I'm going to be outside the line, but I'm going to be offsetting a little bit to bring the bit in to cut a, ch a nice little chamfer, just a very small chamfer on the edge. Uh, so uh, I'm going to um, go with a negative um, point one two five inches. We'll see what that looks like. Calculate. Oops. This is only going to be about uh, sixteenth of an inch. I can use the chamfer toolpath on this. Uh, let me just show you a sixteenth of an inch. We'll do it both ways. Uh, calculate that toolpath. Okay. So that just creates a nice little, uh, I don't know what that was. Uh, it's supposed to be a V-bit laney. My 90 degree V-bit. Calculate that again. All right. So it's just going to be a nice little chamfer on uh, the top edge of these letters uh, when this profile cut gets cut out or when the saw comes and cuts this out it'll cut that edge off for me but I could use the chamfer tool path as well just so y'all because I know somebody's gonna ask about it chamfer tool path this tool path is going to start depth at zero it's going to be using a 90 degree V bit okay uh, the cut depth uh, the depth of that cut is going to be based off of uh, uh, we'll go an eighth of an inch. We'll go an eighth of an inch. Uh, this is going to be sloping. Um, the deepest part of the cut is going to be here, coming from the inside. The deepest part of the cut are where the arrowheads are, right? So I'm cutting down and chamfering down that edge and stuff. So if I count, it's going to be an inside cut sloping upward. So when I calculate that, if I reset that preview, let's zoom in, preview the selection tool path. All right, that creates a much bigger chamfer because I went an eighth of an inch deep. I might be able to, you might be able to view that a little better. Let's change that from maple to cherry so y'all can see it a little better. Um, there's those chamfered edges. Eighth of an inch is a little bit too much. Uh, let's bring that down. <clears throat> to a sixteenth. I just want a small chamfer on the edge. Okay, just a slight chamfer on the edge, and uh, when my saw comes in and cuts uh, down the middle here, it's going to cut those edges off and all, and give me that nice chamfer. So either one of the uh, those options will work: the profile cut or the chamfer toolpath for that particular cause. Um, so we'll have our letters and our little chamfer cut. And again, I'm running this, I'm going to be uh, setting my table saw up, uh, to cut this, uh, uh, on the table saw, just cut these letters free on the table saw. And, uh, it's going to be much quicker than having the end mill try to run all those multiple passes and everything. I can cut them out in a flash. If you got a table saw, use it, right? You know, use your tools, band saw, same thing. Use your tools for what you're using the tools for. Okay, if I was using my band saw, I'd have a much thinner blade, so my spacing would be much thinner as well on here as well. Uh, but uh, I'm gonna be using my table saw and I have an eighth inch curved blade. Okay, same thing really quickly. I keep saying really quickly, but it doesn't get any quicker. Um, on this here, we're going to uh, 
select the letters Okay, I grabbed a few boxes, uh, this whole row of boxes here I grabbed accidentally, so I'm gonna turn those off. And the same thing, I grabbed this second row of boxes here. I didn't mean to, my box was too big. All right, uh, this is going to be a V-carve toolpath. Uh, 10,007 inch start depth is gonna be great. Uh, calculate that Let's see what tool I've got going on here 60 degree V bit that's good um, Make sure there's no other boxes selected. It's acting like there is. Double check. Okay. Uh, calculate. Now that V car should not be cutting through. That V carve should not be cutting through. Let's do that one more time. Drawing that box, just selecting the letters. All right, I'm gonna click calculate this so I can see what, what's cutting through. Ah, uh, the star, the star is wanting to cut through. So I'm gonna leave the star off for a minute. set that preview preview that toolpath okay on the start uh, it's going to be a V carve cut as well uh, but it is going to have a flat depth I'm going to limit it to um, about a sixteenth of an inch Okay, and then finally, select these boxes. Making sure that my letters are not being touched or selected. Um, Profile tool path, 16th of an inch cut depth, 90 degree V bit on the outside of the line, uh, stepping over an eighth of an inch, calculate, preview the visible tool path. Again, just putting a nice little chamfer on the edges of those, uh, which is fine. So again, the chamfer tool path or the, uh, the profile cut, either way. Uh, whichever one you decide just stick with one don't do both do one or the other um, and stuff okay drilling operation uh, my waist hole alignment holes man we're getting we're running out of time here guys uh, we've gone long enough tonight uh, drill this is gonna cut down a quarter of an inch deep I'm sorry three-eighths of an inch deep No dwell, board alignment holes, 
Yeah, I got the wrong thickness on this. Uh, we'll get that. Uh, it should be a half inch thick. No, 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 no. This is the right thickness. My tiles are only going to be three eighths. Remember, I said I was going to resaw my three quarter inch board. I don't want too much weight on my tiles. Uh, I don't want them to be too heavy. They're going to be three eighths. Um, and calculate. Okay. Those go up to the top there. Uh, border alignment holes, everything. Okay, so all that's done. Now I need my magnet holes. Very quickly, I'm going to draw a quarter inch diameter in the center of that hole there. And I'm going to use an array. Uh, this is going to be one, two, three, four rows. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen columns. Okay. All right. So inch and a half by inch and a half is not the right spacing so let me measure what my spacing is If I measure my gap distance from the right side of this hole to the right side of this hole, okay, and that should be consistent here if my spacing is consistent, which it looks to be, from the bottom of this to the top of this. 1.379, 1.389. So one of my holes is off. Uh, let's go select the circle, select the rectangle, use the alignment to align to center. That one was off. Circle, rectangle, align to center. That one was good. This to this, align to center. That one was good. All right, let's do that again. Measure. Horizontally from here to here, 1.3839. From here, vertically to here, 1.3926. Mm -mm. Okay, that means that's where I'm off. Oops. Okay. Somehow or another, my spacing got off. That should be an eighth of an inch gap in between those. So I've got to fix that, right? How do we fix it very quickly? We come in and select this whole second row here. Okay, I'm gonna group it together uh, for this. I'm going to drag it down and snap it to the top of this here. And I'm going to and notice that these rectangles are off, right? So we'll bring those to zero in just a minute, but I'm gonna, um, this one is set correctly right here, so I'm kind of working off that. I'm gonna move that up relative on the Y, 0.125, okay? Now, this row here, 
is just off my zero, everything except for the D. So I need to select it. And on the move, on the absolute, okay, I'm referencing off the bottom left corner here. My bottom left corner, this should be at zero on the Y. Bottom left corner should be at zero on the Y. So I can click apply and that will shift that down. Okay, so now I have my eighth inch spacing between row one and two. And now row three, I'm gonna group that together for a moment. Drag this down and snap it to here and then move it relative an eighth of an inch. Same thing here. Move it relative an eighth of an inch. Okay. So now what that's done for me is on my vertical Okay, I have that eighth of an inch, but I'm still off on my horizontal. So we're going to select uh, and ungroup everything again that was grouped together. And that's what we get for trusting the uh, the nesting tool to do it right by me. The nesting tool didn't do right by us. So, shit happens, we gotta deal with it, we gotta fix it. So what I'm doing is I'm grouping these rows to make it quicker for me. Because I've gotta snap and move, snap and move, snap and move. Okay, so over here, I'm gonna snap this over to here and move it on the X relative an eighth of an inch. Take this row here, snap it to here, move it relative an eighth of an inch. This row here, rinse and repeat all the way across. And yes, it sucks that we have to do it, but we have to do it, right? We gotta deal with it. So it's a lot of rinse and repeat all the way across. So I'm snapping it to the outside edge and then I'm relatively moving it over an eighth of an inch. So that way I have an eighth of an inch spacing here because that's what I want. I want it just the thickness of my kerf of my saw blade. A few more rows. I will, we're only gonna do one, one of these. I'll go back and do and fix the other ones before I send the files out uh, and make sure everything is perfect for them so it's less headache for you. All you got to do is cut and carve. But at least you get to see how to do this stuff. All right, point one, two, five. Two more rows. Okay. So now um, we got our spacing. I'll go through and make sure that all of our tool paths are recalculated for that and everything. Uh, but now that I have that uh, position, I should be able to measure from the outside of this circle to the inside or the left, right side of one circle to the left of the other uh, horizontally. Should be 1.375 from 
vertically. 1.375. Now that I know what my gap distance is, I can delete those measurements and use my array tool. Oops, don't do that. Uh, ungroup that and delete that and delete this. All right, use my array tool and I want uh, four rows, 15 columns with a gap of 1.375 on both of these. Go ahead and click copy. While those copies are, so what in the heck? Undo. Make sure that's 1.375, not 1.75. Copy, there we go. All right, with that, uh, I'm going to hold down the Shift key, deselect these two right here because we don't need them. While the rest are still selected, I'm gonna group them together and I'm gonna go ahead and jump over and move them to the other side. I don't need them here, right? That way I don't have to play around. While they're selected, get everything moved and all of that stuff so you don't have to deal with it. Uh, so now all my magnet holes are where they're supposed to be on the other side. And uh, I can select them and create my drilling tool path. Once again, this material is going to be three eighths of an inch thick. Uh, my carving uh, is cutting about a sixteenth of an inch deep. So I'm going to do just like I did on board number one is I'm going to subtract 0.09. It'll leave me a little skin in between the two. Uh, and that'll be my cut depth. I do want to dwell a little bit, three seconds, um, on that just so it kind of cleans that bottom up a little bit. And uh, that'll be my holes. Okay, so on the uh, V-carve tool path for the um, that's the star. Let me ungroup all these. They're ungrouped. Okay, I lost my V car for some reason. Uh, quickly, let me get it back. Let me get it back. Big Arf Toolpath. Okay, preview that. Preview my star. The profile cut. Let me recalculate that toolpath because remember we move things. Preview that. Okay, wonderful. And on the other side, we've got our magnet holes. And then we, when that board's done, we could take it over to the table saw and cut out those tiles. All right, the star did not get moved. Okay, hold on a second. Uh, my profile cut. Okay, that profile cut and the V-carve cut. All right, that chamfer is cutting into my tin on the Z a little bit. Um, I have to go with a smaller chamfer, but my star cut needs to be recalculated. Okay. 
my 10, the chamfer is getting into that 10 a little there. Um, but I'm going to move it over a little. So the Z. That should have fixed it. Yeah, there we go. Okay. All right. I'll clean up these tool paths, ladies and gentlemen. And Josh Lester, are you part of this group, buddy? Let me know. You must be new to my channel. It's an inappropriate question. Okay. The uh, with that cut, uh, with all that done, I'll clean up the tool pass and I'll get everything over to you. But that'll cut out our tiles. Uh, that'll take care of the tiles. We'll do, uh, there'll be two sheets of that. We're gonna have a small, you're gonna have a small piece for your chalk holder that's going to, you'll get a, uh, a file for that as well. Uh, you can change your size, your board, cut it out of a scrap piece of wood, but it's not gonna, you know, three quarter inch thick. Um, you know, it's only uh, about one inch. Uh, and a box core bit. If you guys don't have a box core bit, just uh, some kind of bit to create a little channel in there. Uh, it could be a, a ball nose bit, you know, if you've got one of those instead or something. But a box core bit uh, or a bull nose bit or a round nose bit, um, any one of those will do fine for that little holder. Uh, and uh, as far as uh, the board goes, you know, um, we still got to flip it over. I've still got to do, uh, you know, on this one, the alignment holes are going to be a little bit different because I don't want to drill holes in this board. Okay. So uh, on this board, I'm going to mark, I'm going to make sure that my, my board is exactly 24 by 36 or whatever size your board is to the T, not off by an eighth, not off by this, by that. Um, and uh, I'm, when I flip, I'm gonna make sure my corners and corners go together because I do not want um, to drill alignment holes. If I did drill alignment holes, then I would patch them back up. I'd put a plug in there so they would be you know, invisible. I don't want them being visible. But uh, we'll look at that, I'll look at that. But uh, you know, I'm just gonna flip and just make sure that everything is nice and aligned and everything. And the reason why I say make sure your board is to the T because I'm working from the bottom left corner and this is 24 inches tall. If, if my board is 24 and an eighth, when I flip this board end over end, okay, and I put that end up against where my XY zero is, everything in my design is shifted, you know, it's not right. Uh, you know, I'm off by that, you know, the eighth of an inch or what have you. Um, so we need to make sure we line up properly. And uh, that's why alignment holes are so useful. But um, uh, to be able to flip things, I don't know what I want to do with alignment holes on this. Uh, like I said, if I do make alignment holes, uh, then I'll end up plugging them. I'll end up doing a plug cutter or something and cutting a plug. Uh, not on the CNC, of course. But uh, when those tiles get uh, cut out, uh, the word Scrabble, the Scrabble word, uh, that'll get glued on here. You can create outlines if you want where they would go, but it's just going to get you know glued on there and nice word Scrabble. Your holders here, if you don't want to do the fillets on the holders, uh, just round off the corners of the piece that's getting glued in. Uh, nice little chisel work uh, just to round them off so they fit into that opening. Still do the offset of a 20, that two thousandths of an inch uh, and all. But 
fun little game. Might be fun, you know, hang up on a wall or whatever, uh, you know, and, uh, you know, everybody grabs, every, every player gets seven tiles, right? You grab your seven tiles, and uh, they can take turns walking up to the board and, uh, you know, sticking the letters on and all that stuff. Um, uh, you, if you wanted to make a little holder for someone to sit in their lap for the tiles, right, for their tiles, just like if it was a table game, you know, they'd have that little tray that their letters go in and stuff. If you want to make, you know, this is something that's going to be hanging on a wall, so they're going to be standing up at this to put it in and everything. But if you wanted to, you know, when they're sitting down while the other person's doing it, if you wanted to make a little tray or something for them to shuffle their tiles around to make their words, come up with that, right? You know, make something like that and stuff. I'm going to complete this design and clean it up for you. And uh, with that, we're going to say good night, guys. Sorry that it was three hours uh, for this. Um, I was hoping that I had a majority of it done just to kind of, I didn't realize I had so much left over to do. I would have done a lot of it and just then it would have been easier to just quickly explain. Um, how would you hang it? Kool-Aid asks, uh, on the back side where, you know, I'm going to be doing my magnet holes and stuff, but I'd also be doing keyholes. Uh, I can use the, uh, keyhole gadget, uh, to cut a couple keyholes in Vetric or if I'm, if I'm in desktop and I don't have that, uh, then I can draw my little rectangles and all. If you're wondering about keyholes and all, I did a video on, uh, on that. We talked about that, uh, it was probably about five weeks ago. So five weeks back, I don't know the name of the video, but um, uh, the keyhole gadget, or you can draw a small rectangle where you, you know, for the length that you want your slot to be. Um, there, let's shit, let me just show you. Uh, you draw a rectangle however long you want your slot to be. In this case, I'm gonna go with one inch uh, slot by one thousandth of an inch, okay? Very small, one hundred thousandths of an inch, 0 0.0001, all right, super small. I'm gonna zoom into that rectangle. I'm gonna go into node editing mode and I'm going to, um, let's see if it'll let me zoom in even more to that, there we go. Uh, in node editing, I'm going to remove that span. And that's gonna be the vector for my keyhole toolpath. My bit will go in, cut, come, raise up that one ten thousandths of an inch, uh, and then uh, come back and exit out of the hole that it made. Keyhole slot, you use your keyhole bit. It's a profile cut on the line. Your depth of cut is the head thickness of your uh, keyhole slot. So mine's a quarter inch. Uh, so my keyhole slot's a little, little about 0.26. Uh, and then, you know, um, that's your cut depth. You know, however much meat you want left over, you know, for your slot, you know, how thick you want it to be. This is gonna be a big, big size board. So if I have a quarter inch head, then I'm probably gonna cut down about three eighths of an inch deep. Um, just make sure you don't exceed your neck length, right? But uh, that's how you create a keyhole toolpath is you draw a small rectangle with a 0.0001 height, cut off the left end vector so you have a start point and an end point, and it's a profile cut on the line. You use an end mill, you use your dummy end mill, like an eighth inch end mill, uh, because you can't draw a key, you can't add a keyhole tool to your tool database. It's gotta be set up like a dummy end mill. So if I go up to my list of dummy end mills, dummy bits, I've got a key old bit that's set up as like a quarter inch end mill because all it uses is the feed rate and the plunge rate and the RPMs if you got a spindle, but it uses those only, but you're gonna have your keyhole bit in the router instead. All right, okay guys, um, y'all have a wonderful night and uh, Yep, uh, y'all have a wonderful night, and uh, that's how you would hang it. Keyhole slots would be a great way to hang it, or a French cleat. If you know what a French cleat is, if you don't, YouTube it. Uh, French cleats are great. Uh, put a strip of wood down at the bottom, uh, another uh, strip of wood at the top that has a 45 degree cut on it on your wall, another board with a 45 degree cut on it hanging outward, uh, so it French cleat and it hangs up. French cleat's a great way to hang this board up on the table uh, if you don't wanna use keyhole slots. So if you don't know what a French cleat is, YouTube it, and uh, they're great. They're great for hanging all kinds, making tool racks in your shop and everything. 
All right, everybody. Until next time, y'all have a great evening. See ya.